So how do we do that with the better? Okay. Good evening. We'll call the, into order the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees for the San Marcos CISD uh, here at uh, High School, uh, 2601 Rattler Road on May 18th at 6 o'clock. Um, just as a matter of making sure everybody is, uh, we can hear you and you can hear us. If we can do like an audible roll, so if you can unmute yourself. Um, so I can just make sure everything's working. If you don't mind, thanks. Uh, what I see left and right, Ms. Castilla, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I cannot hear you. Uh, Mr. Adama? Uh, I'm muting it myself. Can you hear me now? I don't know. Let's see, I think this might be the problem. Maybe it's me more than y'all. Uh, Ms. Halsey? Yes, yes, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. These aren't working. You're, you're, mm -hmm. That's all right. I'll just go out. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hey, Ms. Piapondo, you're present. I can hear you. I can hear you. Um, she's about 15 feet to my right. Ms. Cantu? Here. Here. Ms. Costilla, again, are you, are you, can, can, are you present? present? I see you. I see you. Can, I hear you? can I hear you? I am here, I but you. I can uh, barely I can hear, hear you. you. Headphones more than it was you uh, being unavailable. So, sorry about that. All right, we're great. We'll call the meeting to order. Okay. okay. John, I can barely hear you. You can barely hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll try to speak up. Can you hear me? This is Kathy. Okay, yes, Ms. Hansen, I hear you. Thank you. Okay. Come again. Is everything okay? Because I can't hear you. I can't hear anything either, so I'm not sure if something is going on. Is anyone talking? It sounds like they're sticking to Oh, okay. And we'll try to figure that out. Are we doing the pledge? Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I see the name, right? Okay, I'll do that. In the name and, the, and by the authority of the state of Texas, I, Margie T. D. Alfondo, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the duties of the office of San Marcos CISD School Board District 2 of the state of Texas and I will best I will to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States and of this state to help me talk. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Margie. Can you hear me? No? No? Yeah, I can hear you. I said congratulations, Margie.
Okay, we had one public comment uh, submitted uh, meeting, which I'll read verbatim. Mr. McLaughlin, Mr. Cardona, and members of the board, my name is Susan Seaton, president of the San Marcos Educators TSTA. I am addressing you tonight in regards to salary and benefits for our employees. We as an employee association for our district understand the financial implications of today's economy and the uncertain future of our climate and economy in the coming years. We ask first that the board adopt the $8 a month increase for our insurance coverage and keep an option for employees at zero cost. Concerning salaries, we have spoken to our board of directors and many of our hourly employees to obtain feedback regarding raises and stipends. We as an educator group want to be good stewards of the district monies and partner with the administration for the best interest of the district. We understand that raises may not always be an option and that stipends offer a one-time pay incentive that doesn't increase a deficit budget. A stipend can be taken from fund balance and will not cause future years indebtedness. If the administration and the board feel this is a better solution for salaries this year, we support this initiative. We would also we would also ask that the stipends be awarded in November for our employees and as the budget and finances allow. These stipends be considered a second time at the end of the year. We ask that you continue to remember the incredible work and hardships that our employees have endured during this last year and the changes and flexibility that will be required during the next several years. We are all in this together and our hope is that SMCISD will weather the storm, become stronger, and fang on. go purple, go white, with thanks Susan Seaton, San Marcos Educators President, TSTA. Okay, that was the only public comment I received. Apologies, y'all, I think I'm working now. And I obviously made some, didn't have it going soon. So, all right, uh, we're up to item number six, superintendent's report, Mr. Cardona. Okay. okay. Good, Good evening, evening, Board President board McLaughlin board and members of the board. board. Um, Mr. Mr. Fernandez, Fernandez is in the process of bringing up, up the, the superintendent's report. report. So, so you, you should, should at some, some point, point see, hopefully it'll work, work. The, screen. the screen. All right. All right. And we've and muted all of you so I can so get through can this because it creates, creates feedback, feedback as we're talking. talking. So, so next slide, slide Mr. Fernandez. Fernandez. So first so of all, last week we had Teacher Appreciation Week and as most of us do, we want to celebrate the teachers and the amazing work that they have done in this uh, intriguing time. So if you can go to the next slide. So we just wanted to share with you who the Teachers of the Year are from each campus. Tony Frazier from Bonham, Monica Martinez from Bowie, Dylan Jones from Crockett, Brandy Crow from De Zavala, Sharif Hamp from Hernandez, Joe Merchant from Mendez, Heather Fizzle from Travis, Jessica Boteo from Rodriguez, Melody Carlisle from Goodnight, Stephen Lee from Lamar, Stacy Cole from Miller, and Tasha Martin from San Marcos High School. Next slide, please. From that, we selected the district's teachers of the year, the San Marcos Education Foundation, and our teachers of the year for elementary are Monica Martinez from Bowie Elementary. She is a special education teacher. She has an amazing story of why she got into education uh, through her family and through her watching her father uh, help a sibling of his who had special needs. And Stacy Cole, who is the avid teacher, uh, for, uh, Miller for Miller Middle School, School is, the is the secondary, secondary teacher, of teacher of the year. These two, These two teachers, teachers will move on to the region to compete, to compete if they win they the region and they go to they state, state and then potentially nationals. So we wanna so congratulate, congratulate them, them for winning. winning. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We also we want also to want congratulate Ms. Diana, Diana Garcia, Garcia who, who most of you know won the HEB Lifetime in Education Award winner. With that, she wins $25,000 for herself and then $25,000 grant for her campus, which she has asked go to support the dual language program that is there at De Zavala. She's a most deserving candidate. If you know her, she's involved with the Cinema Club. She started the Selena Writing Project. She works with the Calaboose Museum and some other areas. She's a huge advocate for our community, for our students and for our families. And we congratulate her uh, on her victory. 
And we also want to thank uh, Ms. Villanueva, the campus principal, who nominated her uh, for that category. Next slide. Again, we also want to thank our child nutrition, transportation, all of our administrators, instructional coaches, nurses, and maintenance, um, and also our central office cabinet staff who have worked tirelessly since March to provide a continuum of services for our students. And we've done um, really, I think, an outstanding job in, in addressing the needs of our families. Next slide. In particular, we, you know, as of Friday, our child nutrition staff has uh, distributed 81,545 meals. And you can see the breakdown with breakfast and lunch. And again, this does not include transportation, working with school fuel, with the Hayes County Food Bank and with uh, Texas State to provide meals that our parent liaisons and our tenants officers identified as, as needing food to be delivered to them, which I, wonder, I believe is about a little over 100 families now, uh, about three, over 300 kids, I think that it impacts. And they take two weeks worth of uh, lessons uh, and meals to them. And so that number probably more is in the range of about 90,000 uh, meals. Next slide. Also at this time, uh, you know, the board had approved our uh, director of facilities and maintenance and also our director of construction management. And so they're going to pop on here so that you can see their faces and just say hello. So Mr. Wyatt, if you're on here, if you could turn your screen on and just say hello. Uh, hello, everybody can hear me, hear me. This is Mr. Percy Wyatt comes to us from Houston, Texas. Don't be uh, fooled by his youth. He has uh, done a lot with facilities and has built schools all over the world. And we're truly blessed to have him working with our principals and our children here in San Marcos. And also Mr. Bernie Sandoval, who's our director of construction management. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here. I didn't see him, but I know he's there somewhere. Next slide. Mr. Sandoval comes to us from the oil and gas industry and has a wealth of knowledge around project managing large projects. And so we're excited. I also wanted to talk to you. I think these numbers are a little bit off. I think my, I know my numbers are off. I think we just crossed the 40% threshold for San Marcos. Uh, we are sending out census information um, pretty much pretty weekly to our families, but I think the reality, the reality is, is, as we move we back to back some to sense of normalcy in the fall, we're gonna have to bring our families in to have them complete uh, the census. Our principals are already beginning safe plans of doing that, maybe in August of having a family night where we have um, that done in person so that we can ensure that that, that happens. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. You know, just to put it in perspective, we this is just the district. This does not include the principals sending out messages. So we've sent out through our social media apps, to through text, through email, through the district app. And just to put it in perspective, we reach about 15,000 cell phones on text messages, about 13,000 email addresses, social media, it's broken down by about 3,000 on Facebook, 2,000 on Twitter. The district app reaches about 4,500 per message, and our district website is averaging about 37,000 views weekly, and we have that on our website. And then just today, if you go to the next slide, you will notice that in front of the high school here, we have a buses, and this is what we've put, working with the county, count me in, it's my future. And so we are putting these buses throughout the various portions of the community to advertise. Uh, the, uh, the census, census as, well. as well. And so thank you to thank Mr. Wozniak and, and, and the, the, the bus driver, driver the transportation, transportation staff. staff. If we could go to the next slide. Wanted to Wanted give, to a, give little a little bit of an update on graduation. graduation. Uh, you know, you know virtual, virtual graduation, graduation we have we scheduled, scheduled for May 29th, 29th at 8 p.m. Mrs. Mrs. Presley, Presley, who's on this call, call is, is um, um, working on something with a uh, business person so that we honor each of our um, graduates in a virtual way. 
I believe we may be asking you all for at least a video or a picture or something so that we can include that. In-person graduation, I know that last week I had mentioned uh, a potential date of June 5th. Uh, after, after doing, doing some, some uh, more in-depth in research and talking, talking to Mr. Wozniak, Wozniak, who's working with the county and the city, and, the city, uh, and uh, just and gathering some more some data, data just, just really became an uncomfortable situation to have it on June 5th. 5th. And so and we so will be we messaging, messaging to our students, students and to our parents, parents tomorrow morning, morning uh, a, letter a letter from, from me to me them explaining that we are postponing in-person graduation until July 17th. That's, That's our, our next, next opportunity. opportunity. That'll give us about another month to look and see uh, how this COVID-19 COVID is uh, progressing. Hopefully, Hopefully things, things will get better and then maybe in a safe manner, we can do something to honor our graduates. Uh, but the reality is, as I mentioned in the letter that will be coming out, it may be that we don't have it. And I don't want that to take away from the accomplishments that our kids have uh, and our families have contributed uh, throughout the course of our uh, students' student educational education career, career, you know, this, this is but one moment, moment in uh, the, the students', students time. time, you know, it's the end of their high school, school and their schooling, schooling career at the lower level, level but it's the beginning of their life. And so uh, we're, uh, just we're just in a very, very unique situation. situation. So, so again, again, to reiterate, we will be sending a letter out tomorrow, tomorrow uh, postponing in-person in graduation, graduation until July 17th, which will give us another look at what's progressing. I know this weekend we had a, a couple more cases here in Hayes County, about 13 or 14. And so we're not seeing the trend go down. Next slide. And at this point, I wanna turn it over to Mr. Wozniak, who's gonna get on and he's gonna talk about as we begin the process uh, of trying to clean the buildings for summer and even looking forward, you know, we've already begun the process of thinking through some of these things probably that some of you worry about. So with that, I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to Mr. Wozniak. Good morning, board members, President McLaughlin, Mr. Cardona, Doug Wozniak, Director of School Safety. As you may or may not know, there was a couple um, couple announcements today. One, um, the governor put out a, another press conference uh, guiding us into phase two. And at the same time, TEA released um, their uh, guidance for reopening this summer as far as activities and summer instruction. So we in the district have been working for the last couple of weeks in anticipation of that and um, possibly bringing our employees back in June. And so what we've done is we, we've created a couple different plans. The first one is, is more of a short-term plan that addresses summer. And we've got um, a couple documents that we're using. We've got um, the first one, which is kind of a generic overview for all the departments and in it, it states our, our objective, which is to resume district operations on June 1st. And then we have our command emphasis, which is, you know, talks about things like restricting visitors and volunteers, um, Social distancing, uh, trying to be in an office by yourself if that's applicable, cleaning, you know, everywhere that somebody's been as far as doorknobs, um, limiting um, public access. If masks are available, uh, we will we will provide masks if they are not, but that will be a requirement for all of our staff members when accessing a public space, they'll be required to wear a mask. And then so on the second page of our plan, we've got, um, we've got what's called a, a safety brief. And in that, we've got, again, kind of a generic message that, that goes across um, all of our departments um, in regards to disinfecting, um, again, social distancing. And then we, we have what's called site-specific. So for instance, like for transportation departments, site-specific would be um, that employees will verify with supervisors that they have taken their own temperatures and complete a self-screen, either by using a self-checker or CDC from the CDC website or going over the attached list. So we've got things like that. The um, meetings will be held virtually or at the annex where chairs will be spaced on markers six feet apart. So in there, I've got probably about 10 bullet points and each department has been tasked with doing the same thing. So every single department, including our campuses will have this plan in place. That we hope will kind of provide us with a blueprint um, for what August will look like. Um, for instance, on Friday when we were doing our um, our feeding program with our with our drivers, we're trying to come up with the best way um, to verify that we've done that checklist. So the checklist 
is going, going to be a protocol, right, right that's, that's, that's across, across the, board. the board. But how we how implement we that, that might be might different, different at each department. department. So we tried a, uh, a Google, Google form, form where, the, where our, our, our personnel had to verify that they didn't meet any of those requirements, right, and a temperature check. Well, we found that that took forever. So now we move on to the next week of trying something different of how to verify that they've indeed done that checklist. So that's what we're, we're hoping to accomplish in June is, is all our protocols will be in place and we'll build on those for August. We also have a, a larger plan. Um, I am on the, uh, I'm fortunate to be on the recovery uh, task force for the county. And so the county now is, is working very closely as, as a group, as a task force to, um, to provide guidance in all the different phases. So our plan piggybacks off the county's plan. So we have a long-term plan in place right now that matches up with all the phases. So as you know, we're going into phase two now, which means the, the, uh, the county will have a response to phase two and then SMCISD will have a response to phase two and then we move on down to phase three and four. So in the long run, right, the last phase would be um, would be something like return to normal operations, which as you know, you know that may not happen for a couple of years, but phase three would be kind of more along the lines of a hybrid um, schedule that we would possibly look at for August. Um, we are also forming what's called an SMCISD recovery team. Uh, that will be created this week and that will have members of, of all the different departments. They'll have representation from um, our admin, admin and really the, really the goal, goal in, in, in doing, doing this, this is to guide our cabinet, cabinet with options. options. Um, um, we don't want to be in a position in, in August, August where uh, cabinet, cabinet comes to us and says, we'd like to do this. this. And then we and answer, well, we, we don't think we don't that's think possible. possible. We want to come up with those plans ahead of time with, with being proactive. proactive. For example, For example we, we already know that transportation is going to be a a huge, a huge obstacle, obstacle for us in August. August. We've seen the guidelines. In fact, the guidelines that came out today for the TEA have already um, said to uh, restrict the, the six foot distancing on a bus. So that's gonna be about 14 kids on a bus. So if um, Dr. Ruiz Mills comes to me and says, you know, you're gonna have to run three routes. We wanna know ahead of time that that's possible or that's not possible at each school. So the goal is, um, is to, to collaborate, collaborate with each, collaborate other, each other because this, this is above, above all, all probably, probably any other time in our history, history, right? It's, it's going to be one, gonna of be one of those times where, where our departments, our departments are going to have to work so closely, closely together, together with the schools, with the schools because transportation, transportation, custodial, custodial services, services, food services, services are all going to be a, a, uh, a driving uh, force in what instruction looks like. Because even recently, CDC mentioned lunch in the classrooms, right? And then how does that look? So. Just, just, just forming that group to try to provide, provide some guidance, guidance to, um, to um, cabinet, cabinet would be very helpful. Very helpful. And, then and then our, our three our main things that we're things really thinking about right now are planning, preparation, and, and adaptation. Uh, we know that planning is very important to get going now and to prepare. Um, we're, we're ordering everything we can order right now. We're, we're Cindy and, and Andrew are, are ordering masks for those that don't have them. Um, but again, as you've seen, we've got guidance from the White House, we get guidance from the governor, the county, the city, and we've got to be ready to change and be flexible um, because we don't know what's, what's next, next week might be. I mean, it could be totally different. We could be in a different phase. We could regress. And so we just have to surround ourselves with people that are going to be flexible on this team, on this um, recovery team, guiding committee, and that, um, you know, that think outside the box. Hey, hey, Mr. Wo yeah, Mr. Wozniak, I know Mr. Arredondo has a question. Go ahead, Mr. Arredondo. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Force President. Uh, yes, Mr. Wozniak, if possible, I didn't see it in our board book. If I missed it, I apologize. Is there any way that trustees can get a copy of whatever report or presentation that you are speaking about right now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes I'll have... Um, I'll have each department uh, document to you. And like I said, the first page and a half will all look the same, but then that second page will have very specific. And then the, the long run, I can try to tease it out. The, um, the county's not ready to release their big plan yet, and I'm part of, of that in there. So that still remains um, a draft, but I'll get that to you as soon as, as we can. I'll be meeting with the county on Thursday, and, that, and that's what we work on during those meetings, and they will, um, they're will they going to release that to the public very soon. Uh, thank you. And just as a clarifying point, I am comfortable without getting the county's portion of this document. Obviously, the ISD has various levels of things that are being asked for, so I am totally fine with just getting the ISD side of that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay.
Uh, any other questions from colleagues? No. Uh, Mr. Wozniak, are there any, as a part of the committee you serve on in the planning group, are there any physicians that are members of that group? Yes, sir. There's a, there's a few. The, um, and there's a few members from Texas State. It's well represented. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think it'd be helpful in addition to the district's plan if we could get the constituency of that working group. Uh, that would that would help me individually. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Takes us through. Uh, we're back. Still in reports and information items, Mr. Cardinal. Yes, Mr. President, I'm done, and I think we are on to um, academic update from uh, Dr. Reese Mills. Okay, item 7A, draft summer instructional program. Mr. Reese Mills. Yes, good evening, Board of Trustees. In your board book, you have a draft of our summer extended learning programs. They have since been updated since we put the board book together. But as you will notice, we do have summer school occurring for pre-K and kindergarten, elementary, middle school, and high school professional development and a work day for our uh, teachers that will be doing our virtual summer school will be on June 2nd and 3rd and elementary and middle school summer school will begin June 8th and will extend through the 25th and high school will continue all the way through July the 16th. We also have in July some programs uh, sponsored by our Gear Up, which will be an ELA English language arts enrichment camp, along with a summer bridge algebra camp that will begin on July 20th. In addition to that, we're offering some other virtual academies such as the Gear Up Virtual Challenge, and there is also an adventure camp, the Texas Triangle Tour Construction Academy, where all of the activities and learning will occur online. And then once uh, we are able to take field trips later in the year or next summer, there will be an extension of that learning that was done online. It will be done face to face. Face. So wanted to give you a summary of the extended learning program. Also included in the board book was the professional development plan. This is our professional learning opportunities for our teachers, which will take place virtually as well. It will go to the DEIC tomorrow for approval. But some of the big rocks that we'll be focusing on are technology, data-driven instruction, literacy and math, social emotional learning, again, with an emphasis on teacher self-care and on student mindfulness. And of course, everything falls under the AVID framework. Um, do you have any questions? Ms. Halsey. Yes, thanks. I'm I have, I have two, two questions. questions. One, One is for Ms. Ruiz Mills, Mills and the other is for Mr. Cardona. But for Ms. Ruiz Mills, so the summer enrichment programs and the summer school, that's all happening virtually, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then what are the parameters um, for eligibility? Can any student participate in that or is it limited to um, by something? No, ma'am. For high school, we're taking students that are interested in acceleration. Some of the courses that we'll offer for acceleration are government, economics, algebra two, I think English four, earth and science. So there are multiple opportunities for students who just want to take a course. But we're also using summer school as an opportunity to identify the students who did not pass the third nine weeks or did not pass the first semester and bringing them in. And we're also looking at students who uh, we still need to close those gaps. So we'll have some different programs going on for them through the various learning platforms. That's terrific. That's Could terrific. the Could district, district communicate that out to parents? Out because because I'm, afraid I'm afraid that if it just is um, um, campus, campus by campus, campus that it's a clear, clear, coherent, coherent message, message that you just outlaid. Just outlaid. 
Yes, so we'll be communicating that out this week. We had to bring in the administrators that were that interviewed to be the summer school admin. And so we'll be communicating that out this week uh, via Mr. Fernandez's uh, communication. And we're also making personal phone calls as well. So yes, ma'am, we'll put it out there. Great, thank you. And then Mr. Cardona, there was no mention of the graduation parade. Is, is that still so happening? And if so, what is the opportunity for the board to participate in that? Did not mention it. Ms. Presley is on here, so if she wants to chime in, she can. She's sure. Um, we we're not fully. We're publicizing that that's happening, but that is that's a parent-led initiative, and so um, we are supporting the parents in in moving that. I have an email that I can send you. I also send it out to to um, our high school community base with my Sunday afternoon emails. Um, Miss Lamb is the is the parent, and I'm happy to email that to um, Dr. Ray Mills, and she can move that through the board as needed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cantu. You're muted, Ms. Cantu. Okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Go ahead. With the GIRA program, one of the parts of the program that I was looking forward to hearing about was the follow-up that they were going to do. And since this, bit, this has been an unusual spring, I'm still curious how we're going to do the follow-up on our students for the GIRA program. Will we be able to do it? And are you're working with the GIRA ladies to do that? Yes. Are you talking about uh, following the students after they graduate? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So perfect. So we have uh, met with Gira and they have the information and we're going to be tracking the students once they graduate. They have a form that we're getting from Matt Morum, who's the Gira coordinator for UT Texas Gira. And so that's going to be the formula that we're going to be using. I can get a copy of that information and I can send it out to the board so you can see what that tracking and monitoring looks like. Okay. okay. And then there'll be, this will be a form that's going to be sent back electronically or by mail. And then you'll compute all this information to report back to us maybe in the fall. Yes, so what we're going to do is we send it to the students, we collect their information and then we compute it. And then as the fall begins, then we do follow up calls with all of the student information that we have. And then we're going to have to generate it ourselves and most likely create a database to house it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Reese Mills, do you have concerns about the effectiveness of the uh, closing the gap element of summer school without on campus instruction? I think the program that we have developed for summer school will allow us to do targeted support because it's going to be more personalized and individualized based on student need. For example, Nicole Dre will jump in here on a moment on what the elementary will look like. But for any student selected for science, say they have to close the gaps in science, that's going to be more of a project-based learning activity. For English and math and algebra, that will be based on the teacher instruction and providing lessons based on the data that we've received from the final CUA that was given prior to March 13th, and then looking at existing data from our NWEA map screeners. So it's going to look different, but I believe with the type of interaction that the students
students will have with, with the teacher online that will be able to close some of those gaps. We're also looking at um, in August seeing what the parameters are and adhering to the guidelines that the governor and TEA just put out with no more than 11 people in a classroom six feet apart, really doing some targeted support and trying to bring students in at that time uh, dispersed throughout the day at various hours. So that's how we're uh, using it to identify what those gaps are and how we can close it. Ms. Stray, do you wanna talk about what the elementary will look like? Yes. Um, so teachers will have class sizes of approximately 15 students. They will be using our middle of year NWEA data, as well as information from classroom teachers um, and the first um, semester and the third nine weeks information to target instruction. Um, the instruction will be focused um, through um, science, um, science concepts, concepts as the as anchor, anchor and, and then math, math literacy, literacy and social, and social studies, studies um, will be brought in. in. Students, Students will have an opportunity to receive individualized um, support, support from teachers, teachers to fill their, their personal, personal skill gaps. gaps. So, so for, for instance, instance, a student may spend, spend 15 minutes, minutes or 20 minutes one-on-one -on -one with, one with the teacher, the teacher. Um, um, even though even it's though digital, digital, they will, they will uh, all of the all summer school students, students will have, have devices, devices and, and internet, internet capability. capability. Um, um, so, so they'll, they'll still get very individualized, individualized attention, attention um, um, to, to fill, fill those, those skill those gaps. gaps. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dre. So, seeing, oh, yes, Ms. Cantu, go ahead. You're on mute again, but uh, Michael, can you? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Me uh, Reese Mills, have we already projected the number of students that need to do credit retrieval, and have we got a program ready for them? Are they going to do it online? What are we going to do about credit recovery? So credit, credit recovery, recovery is going, going to run concurrently with summer school. We're basing credit recovery off of the third nine weeks grade. And so those are the students that we have been communicating with. So yes, we do have a projected number right now for a combination of high school and uh, for the high school summer school and credit recovery. We're looking at approximately 197 to 200 people that will participate participate in one of those two programs. For middle school, we're looking at approximately 95 students that have been identified That's total from both middle schools that will need summer school or credit recovery for the Algebra 1. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear. I'm done. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. Any other trustees have anything? Ms. Via Pondo, go ahead. You're gonna to have to unmute yourself. And then you can... Oh, hold on. So that we have it on the recording. There you go. I think you're good to go. Um, Ms. Uh, Reese Mills, um, my question is, um, by, by when do we expect, and Mr. Cardona, by when do we expect to have how this virtual uh, education program went through through this last uh, few months of uh, this school year, and and will we able to be able to compare to what it was before? Yes, that's a great question. So again, we'll use our middle of the year screener data that we did prior to spring break. And then once school resumes in session, depending on what that looks like in the fall, then we'll do a beginning of year screener so we can identify the skill gaps and identify uh, where the learning loss occurred so we can go back. We're in the process of redesigning our scope and sequence 
so we so can we bring can in bring those, those standards, standards that we that missed we during the last uh, uh, nine, nine weeks, weeks period, period. And then and we'll, we'll target those as we scaffold in the new teach throughout the year. So there's a big redesign that's going to be occurring, but we'll have all of that information. And so I would say around October board meeting, we can most likely give you a comparative analysis of middle of year and beginning of year. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pando. All right, I don't see anything, don't see anything else. else. Uh, Ms. Costilla, you have a question? I just, I just yes, yes um, Ms. Mills, Mills um, um, our, 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 our seniors, seniors. Did, did they all, they all complete, complete their, their courses, courses or do we have a certain number that have, have to go through credit, credit recovery, recovery for that, for that purpose? Where are we with, with our senior, senior population? population? So with our seniors, we had 21 seniors that needed to complete an IGC. Remember, they're the students that needed to retake an end of course exam. And so out of those 21, 20 of them have completed and the other individual will be completing that IGC this week. As far as credit recovery, our teachers have been working with the students to ensure that they've had opportunities to complete their courses. Technically, if a student uh, does not complete their course and need credit recovery, they'll participate in uh, in the credit recovery that we're offering in June. But Ms. Presley, and she can chime in here as well, has been working with uh, students and teachers to ensure that we were getting them to where they needed to be. Ms. Presley, what is that possible number? Do we know? The possible number of students. When you're, when you're talking, talking about, about the credit, credit recovery. recovery. Ms. Presley, do you have the credit that recovery? That might or might not. Um, I do not have the credit recovery um, number right now. What I wanted my teachers to do since Friday was the last day that we assigned, um, we made, a, we assigned students work. We have, um, so now we have two weeks to go back and double check and make sure that all of our seniors are are intact today we spent the day checking out our seniors um you know checking up checking in their laptops and making sure they get their cap and gowns and they met with their counselors and so now we're looking at the list of kids who didn't come in we actually had some kids show up who we had to say hey you still need you still owe us a little bit more um work so let's go back and finish our assignments and ingenuity etc so we can get a clean list now that friday that deadline of friday being the last day that we offer assignments to students has passed so Today would be the first day that we could get a really clean number and then we'll have the next um, two weeks to make sure that we capture every kid who, who still needs to complete work. Could you send us that number, please, if there is going to be a number that you're talking about? Yes, ma'am, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kostia. Anything else from trustees with regard to the academic update? I think Mr. Reese Mills combined A1 and A2 and spoke of summer professional development, yeah? So we're now to uh, item 7B under reports and information items, a construction update. Good evening, Board President McLaughlin, trustees and Superintendent Cardona. Mr. Fernandez will load our presentation shortly and I, I hope you got a chance to preview uh, this presentation when I sent it to you last week. There we go. On the first slide, you see our budget. And uh, on my screen, the, the faces uh, kind of cover up the right hand column, but that's what we're used to looking at as the amount of savings, the amount of money that is residual in our bond right now. In the last month, we, uh, we saw some savings in the project at Goodnight. Uh, and then we use that money to pay for additional construction administration for our projects that have gone a little bit long and to bring in our construction manager. Uh, as we start this month, we still have just over $1 million left in this bond. And we're going to work to hold on to that for any projects the trustees would like us to pursue uh, once we finish. 
Also notice that we're starting to color the, the different projects as we finish them on our screen. So we truly are in the second half of this bond right now. This evening, in just a few minutes, we'll bring you the Rodriguez Elementary School project, uh, completed it and ready for you to close out. And two of the remaining four should be complete by the end of the summer. So we're moving very quickly uh, forward. And on the next few slides, you can see what that looks like. Our five campus renovation was a major project last year. Uh, there, were uh, there were roofing, roofing corrections that were needed at three, at three campuses. campuses. Right, now, right now, the work, the work is, is underway at Crockett, at Crockett and it and should it be should finished finish before the end of the end month. Of the month. At Travis, Travis, it'll take it'll just about the month, the month of June, and that is that the most is complicated, complicated of the three roof lines, lines to correct. To correct. And then Bowie will be done in July. This is to be done before August, so well shy of students returning to school. The high school the high work school has slowed down just, down just a little bit as a lot of the craftsmen have moved over to uh, work at Miller, where, where we've got a chance to get some work done quickly, uh, unexpectedly. This does uh, intend to finish before the end of the month, however. So we are expecting to conclude this in May. And right now we're looking at sinks and faucets, um, curtains uh, and paint in the broadcast room, and then just minor punch list items. Uh, the last major item is owner furnished and contractor installed, and we're bringing in a technology team to do some of the uh, really intricate things that are in our um, broadcast uh, area. At Miller, uh, it certainly doesn't, uh, it certainly look, doesn't like look like that right now. now. On the next, on the next slide, slide, you can see um, the, details the details of all the different, all different phasing. phasing. But honestly, yeah, I wouldn't get confused by that. By that. I would point I you point to, to um, we have we one, have one priority, priority right, right now, now, and that's and to that's make sure phase two finishes before August. Phase two is our sixth grade, our seventh grade, and our eighth grade hallways that are being remodeled, and that has to be ready for kids. That was that always was a always tight timeline, and we were really, really excited, excited to be able to, to start, start a little bit ahead of schedule, schedule having, having them in there in May, May instead of starting in June, June, and we're taking we're advantage of that. that. Our only concern right now is some long lead items like casework, millwork, cabinetry. Those things just take time to order and that supply chain looks like it's struggling right now. But we expect to have those areas open. Mr. Fernandez, can you go to the next slide? That's what it looks like right now. And the front of Miller Middle School is truly demolished right now. They're doing great work and really quickly. Uh, and we're excited to see it happen. As I mentioned, phase two is what we're watching right now. That's hugely important to us. Uh, it is scheduled to go into August for punch change, but the work is supposed to be done in uh, July and we expect to have occupancy there by August. De Zabala is moving smoothly. It is already underway with demolition. Um, the work on the new main office and the work on the front parking lot. And you can see those pictures on the next slide. And again, that is right on schedule, but we expect to finish that in time for August and students and teachers to return. And then finally, uh, trustees have uh, selected the best value contractor to the district in Seidel construction. Uh, they currently have the contract with them. We're waiting for them to return it to us, but we expect them to start before the end of the month, which again is ahead of uh, schedule and what we had expected to be able to do. Uh, that work should not impede students at all. It's some roofing and a little bit in the cafeteria with bathrooms and in the kitchen. And that is to finish uh, well before students arrive also. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Are there any questions? Okay, any questions, any questions from, from colleagues? colleagues. Okay, okay, seeing none, none. We, can we can proceed to, to um, item, item 7C, a shack, shack update, update um, from Ed, Ed Rios. Rios. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. President. President. Uh, thank, uh, you, thank you, Board you, Trustees. Board can, trustees. You can you hear me okay? okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, All right. Um, um, uh, let's go let's ahead go and uh, bring up the slides. Um, just to uh, recap, uh, SHAC's mission is to coordinate, educate, and support the district, including community efforts, promoting the physical, social, and emotional well-being of students, staff, and families. Uh, we have uh, been very busy this year. Um, a lot of work went into the fall semester and, uh, and bled into right before spring break, uh, before this new situation arose. 
Um, um, some of the things we hit, hit increased suicide, suicide awareness and prevention. Uh, we uh, continued our procedures for the sexual health education program, evaluated the fitness gram results and implemented some recommendations. Uh, we evaluated uh, campus CIPs for SHAC requirements. We evalu evaluated emergency procedures, first response required CPR, first aid, and AED list, <coughs> minor emergency, safe place to be, parent and family awareness. Uh, we, uh, we focused, focused on, on a, lot a lot of the, of the new legislation requirements from the 86th 86, 86, 86, 86, Texas, Texas Legislative Session. session. And, and uh, uh, in our, our August, August report out, uh, back, uh, back in, uh, in the beginning, beginning of the school, of school year, year, we, we presented, presented our SHAC goals, goals to the trustees. To the trustees. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> pretty much uh, uh, some of the things that we, we really hit on. Uh, we, focused uh, we focused on the health and health safety, safety issues. issues. Uh, we, uh, strengthened we strengthened a lot of partnerships, partnerships uh, and, and, you know, with, uh, with uh, health, health initiatives, initiatives in the district for both, for both staff, staff and families. And families. Um, from a governance perspective, uh, this is our third year of appointments and uh, you've been presented with those um, of the new uh, SHAC members every year. Uh, we implemented those uh, revisions of uh, some bylaws at the beginning uh, and we also launched a SHAC uh, new member orientation, uh, very successful in getting folks on board so that we started at the beginning of the year. Um, I, I mentioned the suicide awareness and prevention. I mentioned, mentioned the uh, fitness gram testing. Uh, it continued, uh, continued across, across the district, the district uh, up until uh, uh, until spring break hit us in COVID-19. Um, the, the governor suspended assessment of the physical fitness of students using fitness gram um, just uh, recently. So uh, we're, we're taking that in consideration. Uh, some, additional some additional wellness. There was a lot of adult, adult wellness, wellness opportunities, opportunities uh, for employees that was added this year. Uh, we, implemented uh, we implemented the Heimlich, Heimlich Heroes, Heroes training at all elementary, elementary campuses, campuses, typically scheduled. scheduled. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. The, implementation the implementation of that was canceled at the end of this year. Of this year. Um, um, it, was it was usually something that we did uh, after, uh, after testing, testing and everything, everything. Uh, but, uh, because, but of because of that, we'll be looking at uh, putting that, that uh, next, year next year or whenever, or whenever we're back in session. Go ahead. Catch curriculum, we implemented for training and staff and the coordinator is ensuring that uh, lesson, lesson plans, plans and program, program promotion are, are available. available. We'll have to figure out how all that uh, continues to fit in going forward. Uh, sexual, uh, sexual health education, education uh, was on track and implemented in May, in May uh, or was going to be implemented in May 2020, but was canceled. Uh, we're reviewing a possible online platform for sexual health education uh, to see if that uh, makes sense and fits uh, our objectives and goals. Um, <coughs> we're prepared to address all of the health issues going forward in 2020 and 2021 with COVID-19, uh, really evaluating work on the digital platform for sexual health education, evaluating emergency procedures, uh, first response, continuing that, and preparing for the 87th legislative session in summer 2021. Go ahead. And so thank you all. Hope everybody uh, stays healthy, stays safe. Uh, we were really, really busy last year. We, we plan on being busy this, this coming year virtually as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rios. Okay. Um, any questions from any colleagues for Mr. Rios on the checkup? I think Ms. Cantu might have a comment, but she was going to have to unmute herself. Okay, go ahead, Clem. Thank you, Mr. Rios, for all the work you've done with the shack. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Uh, this brings us to item 7D, HB 3834, mandatory cybersecurity training. Good evening, President McLaughlin, uh, Superintendent Cardona, members of the board. I'm Greg Hubenak, Executive Director of Technology. I'm going to spend only about five minutes or less just uh, raising your awareness uh, of a mandate that we uh, are in the process of uh, complying with, and that's a uh, cybersecurity training. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of a background. Uh, in the 86th legislature, there were a couple pieces uh, of legislation that impacted cybersecurity in Texas schools. Uh, the first one is Senate Bill 820, uh, which uh, requires us to appoint a cybersecurity coordinator and also establishes uh, reporting requirements in the event that we did have a security breach. Uh, the other piece was House Bill 3834, what we're going to speak about tonight. Um, which is the mandatory cybersecurity training for all employees and elected officers. Uh, and just uh, 
Board policy CQB is the board policy that was part of update 114 uh, that governs these two topics. Next slide. Go ahead, Andrew. So the requirements of 3834, um, it, it covers multiple entities, state agencies as well as local governments. Um, but it just simply mandates uh, that every employee must complete a certified training program annually. And the certification comes from the Department of Information Resources. They've started, they've certified uh, multiple courses that districts can choose from. Uh, specifically for local government, uh, the requirement is that all employees who have access to a local government computer or information system be trained annually. It also requires that all elected officials of the local government be trained annually. So a little bit more uh, clarity on what those two bullets mean um, for employees. Access is defined as any person who's been given an account to access any local information system. So the question is continually raised, well, do, do our bus drivers need to take this training? Do our folks that work in the custodial or, or child nutrition need to take this training? Because they really don't access computers very often. Uh, it's been it's very, very clear, the guidance, guidance is that, that anyone that has been has given an account, account and has access is required, is required to take the training. Um, and, and also with elected officials, officials uh, they, they must also take training regardless of whether or not they use a computer, computer or even if they have an account. account. Next slide, please. So, so the campaign, uh, we have embraced a curriculum from a platform called No Before. Um, you may have seen some of those uh, emails come uh, for training in the past. Uh, also the, the phishing campaigns that raises employees' awareness about phishing dangers and how to avoid them. Um, it's already been in progress. Uh, uh, part two was um, issued recently. Uh, so the campaign is underway. But the deadline for completion is June 14th. And June 15th is the deadline for local government to self-report completion to the Department of Information Resources. Uh, it's a single submission. It'll be uh, submitted by Cybersecurity Coordinator, which is myself. Um, and really, that is most of the information about this. Um, the, the final slide is simply uh, where you can learn more uh, about this requirement. Uh, uh, and just a note, note that the documentation, the documentation that, we, that we will retain is the minutes of this meeting, uh, just making sure that the board is aware of this requirement and what SMCSD is doing um, for compliance. We'll keep the, uh, the training completion records from the NOVI Board platform, uh, as well as uh, our receipt of online certification. Um, there is a, a governing body acknowledgement form that can be signed by the board, but it's purely optional. It's only a, a tool that we can use to document compliance, and the compliance documentation that I listed above uh, should suffice. Uh, and just as an aside, there are some employees, it's a little bit ironic, some employees uh, that may have a difficult time getting to a computer to take their cybersecurity training. Um, after June 1st, any employees that have not logged into the platform, meaning that they must have had some difficulty enrolling in the course, uh, we will begin an outreach campaign to reach them with a paper copy. Um, I highly recommend the online course, it's much better. Um, the paper copy is quite dry. Um, also, the training is about one hour. It's three different modules. Uh, it is about an hour's worth of training. And again, this is not an SMCSD requirement. This is a mandate. And I just thought I'd take a few minutes to make you aware. Any questions for me? Oh, let's see here. Okay, I, any questions from colleagues with regard to item 7D? Ms. Halsey. Thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Hubenak, could, could you please send, send us directly, directly the link, link to that to training course, course from you? you? Because, because when, when I get I those get other links, other I don't, don't click on them because I assume that they're all fishing. fishing. So, so. Gotcha. Okay. helpful okay. if it could come directly from you so that I would know that was the right one to do. I'll round up the information to make sure that you guys get it now that you've been made aware so uh, so it'll be clear uh, where the where the uh, training is at. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay, and I think Miss can too. If you'll unmute yourself. I did. Right. I did module two, but I didn't see where module one and three were. 
Well, uh, the the second campaign is uh, is two and three together. Actually, one of the courses is only a couple minutes long. So there's really only two campaigns. There's the, there's the first one, and then the part two is the second one. That covers all three requirements. So do you have a way of seeing if mine went in? Yes. And, and I can go ahead, if, if, you're, if you're unsure which ones you have uh, completed, because in all fairness, this is the same training platform that we've, uh, we've sent training before, uh, stuff that wasn't state mandated. Um, I, I can run a report, I'll provide that information for you guys to let you know for sure where you're at. You can you can uh, email me separately and let me know because I know I did one Sunday which was very short and then there wasn't any more so I didn't know that there was a three. Yeah, in in, in grand total again it's it's two campaigns, uh, three videos, and it's it's a total investment of one hour. An hour. Oh, I don't think I've done one hour, so I okay. think I think I'm good to go. I'll be sure to send you guys a, an update on your progress. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, Mr. Humidad. Yes. 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 Hello. Hello. We, have we have until June the 14th to complete the training. That is the, is the, is the, the absolute last. Correctly? Yes, ma'am. That is the absolute last date because uh, after that date, it will be closed and we're reporting to the Department of Information Resources on the 15th. Okay, so, so once we complete the training, we don't do anything else other than complete, it, complete the modules and you take it from there. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, ma'am, you don't have to do anything else. Once you complete the training requirement, you're, you're done. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, all right, moving on. Eight, eight item, item eight, eight. eight we need to approve some minutes we're going to break, break these up, these up. Uh, because, uh, because we didn't have unanimous, unanimous attendance at both meetings so i'll entertain a motion make sure you unmute yourself, yourself for this segment of our program, our program. Um, uh, entertain, a entertain a motion, motion for, approval approval for approval of the regularly, regularly scheduled, scheduled board meeting board minutes of april 20th 2020, 2020 for anyone who's had a chance to review them i move that we approve the april 20th 2020 minutes a second Okay, a motion by Hanson, second by Cantu. Um, all in favor? Raise your hand or say aye or Lupe, you with us? Ms. Costillo, sorry. All right, that's seven. seven. I did, I saw you there, yes ma'am. All right, so uh, now as to the specially called meeting of May 4th, this was agenda prep a couple weeks ago, which I had to miss because of a work commitment. Yes, Ms. Cantu? I'll make that motion to approve the minutes from May 4th. I second. Okay, I think that was motion by Cantu, second by Hanson. All in favor, uh, either raise your hand or say aye or give me some indicator of approval. Okay, um, and that's, that is six, and I'll abstain. Uh, that takes us to items for action. 9A, consideration and approval of budget amendments, which is on page 36 of your packet. I don't know if Mr. Barton has something to share with us on this. Yes, sir, just a quick summary about each. Um, the first one I mentioned last month when we met that uh, through the quarterly investment uh, report or the quarterly financial report, we demonstrated that we received the revenue we expected in this budget. And so we uh, want to update our revenue so that our budget matches what uh, our projection is. And so we're bringing you a projected revenue addition of 4.587,875, dollars The second amendment is when we had the school shut down, we committed to premium pay for our hourly employees who came in and worked during that time. And this, and this is the, is first, the first pay period that we've, that we've seen, seen, March 22nd through April 4th. We're bringing you a budget, budget amendment, amendment for these costs, costs so that we can register them as COVID related. And you can, and you can see, see what, what departments, departments they're related, related to with, with the great majority, majority going, going to transportation, transportation food, food service, service maintenance, maintenance and custodial. custodial. In total, it's $21,556. And we can and expect we can to have, have this same budget, budget amendment in June and July. The third budget amendment is for the child nutrition. The trustees will remember there was a conversation about uh, bringing in a new bus and remodeling it for our summer feeding program. 
Unfortunately, some of the expenses that we were told would qualify were denied by the USDA. And so we're bringing that to the board in a budget amendment for $41,000, 421. And finally, and this is just correcting our debt service budget, there's no funds associated to it. We need to make sure that we post the appropriate um, uh, proceeds, uh, proceeds and the uh, uh, escrows, escrows when it comes, when it comes to the bond refunding that we did earlier, earlier this year. And we're going to do the same, same budget amendment next, next month for the bond refunding we just completed. completed. The first, the first one, one, Amendment 21, 21 and, the and the last one, one Amendment 24, are just, are just making, making sure, sure our budget, budget, budget revenue, revenue and expenditures are in alignment for first report. Amendment 22 and 23 are additional expenditures. Hey, Mr. Barton, we refresh my memory as to Budget Amendment 20-23. How much did the board previously approve for this bus project? I believe it was just over $100,000 to purchase the bus. The USDA would not purchase the bus. And now um, they have said that some of the things that go into it, such as the seating, do not qualify. And so they bounced that back to us. So we're up to in excess of $141,000 on the bus? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay. And as to the last item, we've done at least three refinances while I've been a trustee and I do not recall handling this as a budget amendment, this interest and in account, you know, for bonds handling it like we have like you're proposing that we do here is there a reason for that change or do i have amnesia i i can't speak for what's happened in the past several years i can tell you we checked this with our auditors and our auditing company did give us a new auditor this past summer and so maybe he likes to see it a little bit differently but this is something that we we wanted to make sure we're in full alignment with uh for when our finances get reviewed later this summer summer because we don't approve this as a part of our, of our budget. budget. When, when we, we do, do our, our annual budget, budget and we set our, our, our M&O tax, tax rate, rate and go through, and our, through our spending, spending. We, don't we don't approve the, the debt, debt repayment, repayment schedule, schedule, schedule for the individual, the individual year. year. Um, um, so it, so it, it seems strange, strange to, me. to me. Yes, sir, you yes, do. Sir, you do. Um, and I'll point that out to you when we do it next month. You approve that, the M&O, you improve the debt service, and you also approve child nutrition. And I'll point those out to you when we do it in June. Okay. okay. Any, questions Any questions from colleagues? colleagues? Ms. Halsey. Halsey. Yes, yes, thanks so much. I had a couple of questions, questions, Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton. Um, the COVID-19 COVID expenses, expenses, we are earmarking those as such because we will be applying to the state for reimbursement, reimbursement. correct? correct? Yes, yes and no. And no. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Right, right now, now the best, best guidance we're getting is to mark every, every single expenditure that's related to COVID. COVID. Um, um, that, that way, if there is an opportunity to recover it, it uh, we, can, we, can we can make, make that, request. that request. We have we had, had some, some good, good luck, luck with grants, grants um, and, uh, and uh, just uh, some just gifts recently to child nutrition. So some of these things are getting washed out. Uh, we, uh, started we started seeing, seeing some of the FEMA, FEMA information, information, and really they're not they're covering not a lot of the technology, the technology and, uh, and uh, even, even some of the some premium pay. pay. They'll cover, They'll cover the cleaning expenses and things like, like that. that. So those, so those initial, initial promises, promises that we heard in March were whatever, whatever you need is going to be covered. Be covered. Mm -hmm. That just that isn't just working out that way. But a lot of these costs, even though we're registering them here as COVID-related in a budget amendment, they are getting washed out by some some savings, expenditures that aren't happening. Uh, right, now right now because we don't, we don't have kids, have kids in school, so we're not buying, buying end of year awards and, uh, and uh, gas, gas and things like that. And we'll get to see that reconcile itself at the end of the year. That's something I'd like you to track and report to the board out on, um, maybe on a monthly basis for the time being so that we can see how that goes because those promises were made to the districts. And I think that you know, um, as a school board trustee, I would be interested in writing some letters about that if, if we do not get the money that we were told that we would have to, to be able to do this. Um, so that's one question. And my other question is um, the transportation costs that we're incurring for the bus, because that bus is going to be used for the child nutrition program, is that going to be billed out of the child nutrition fund balance or out of the general fund balance? We're asking for this out of the general fund balance. We cannot spend it out of the child nutrition account um, I, or USDA denied that. And so we're asking for it out of um, the general fund balance. Okay. 
Okay, what about, I, that's what I wasn't clear on. What about the food services, COVID-19 expenses? Are those going to go to the child nutrition account? No, ma'am, right now we're registering those locally. And again, they'll reconcile out. Um, there is a small general fund uh, in a food service. It is um, under a million dollars right now. And so um, if we need to back, back code some of that, we can, but right now we're, we're keeping them all in the same place. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Barton? Ms. Costea. Uh, I'm just gonna follow up on Ms. Halsey's um, comment or question regarding the expenses related to COVID. So you're saying that even though, um, it sounds like even though it's being washed out, that it's not really hurting our fund balance to a large extent, but are we gonna be kept abreast or the school district as to where this funds might return to the school district, anything related to COVID? And if so, anytime soon? I can absolutely send you an email this week with uh, some of the offsetting funds and the grant with, that we received. Uh, I'll tell you, FEMA, it looks like it's a really intricate process. There's also um, uh, an opportunity more locally, but it doesn't look like a lot of our, our expenditures apply, but we're looking at everything and I'd be happy to make you aware of those different avenues available to us. So, so really, in in essence, um, they are COVID related, and even though they might be COVID related, we might not get the money for those COVID related expenses. Realistically, I believe realistically, there's some of these things that we're not going to receive reimbursement for. Okay, okay, all right, thank you. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, Miss Hanson. Mr. Mr. Barton. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I have down that we've spent for COVID-19 $159,656. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That is, uh, you can see that on page 39. If you look at the COVID-related uh, changes to fund balance down at the bottom, you can see those are the three major budget amendments that uh, you have approved in the last couple months. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, without, if there's no further questions, we can entertain a motion. We probably need to separate these um, if we can, because I anticipate there might be. You can try whatever you want, whoever makes the motion. Mr. Arredondo, I saw your hand first, go ahead. Uh, thank you, President McLaughlin. I will go ahead and make a motion that the board approve budget amendment 2021, 2022, Those two. Okay. I'll second. I have a motion by Arredondo, second by Halsey to approve budget amendment 20-21 and budget 20-22. There's no further discussion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. It looks like that was all of us. That motion carries 7-0. I move that we approve amendment 2023 and 2024. Okay. Motion by Hanson, second by Via Pondo to approve um, items 20-23 and 20-24. Um, as a matter of discussion, I voted against uh, the original bus expense coming out of fund balance because I thought it was excessive and additional costs would be possible. And I continue to think this is a fantastic idea and the purple bus was great governing, great governance because we bought it on the cheap. We serve food to a lot of kids. Now we're buying a Cadillac and get paying like 10 bucks a meal um, on the thing. So when you factor in the bus, so I continue to be opposed to this, but um, we got a motion in a second. So all in favor? Aye. Okay, I see. Hanson via Pondo Cantu and Halsey four. Ms. Costilla, did you vote? I'm sorry. Yes. You were yes. four, okay. Okay, and opposed, I am. And Mr. Arredondo, so that'll carry five two with McLaughlin and Arredondo voting against. That takes us to item 9B, consideration and acceptance of Rodriguez Elementary Bond Project. Yes, sir. We have received the final payout for Rodriguez Elementary School. Uh, the architect has certified it, and now it's for the board to accept it before we pay. Okay. 
by Mr. Adano. Uh, thank you, President McLaughlin. I'll make a motion that the board um, accept the Rodriguez Elementary School bond project as presented by staff. I'll, I'll second. I have a motion by Aradondo and I, I heard Ms. Villapondo first as to the second. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. And Ms. Nicosia, all right, that's seven of us, seven zero. Uh, we're, we're down to item 9C, consideration and approval of an increase in the district health insurance contribution for 2020-21 for employees of SMCISD. This is on page 41 of the packet. Mr. Barton, is there a presentation with regard to this item or are you just leaving it to the board? No, actually it's uh, Marcy Baez. This okay, Ms. Baez, sorry. The presentation was sent. Basically, um, the board has just been generous in the past by contributing $378 per month for each employee for health benefits and that benefit has uh, an $8 increase this year. Um, so it's three eighty six per employee monthly. Okay, I saw Miss Cantu's hand. Miss Cantu, I go ahead. Make the motion that we approve to meet this shortfall for our uh, student, uh, staff and teachers. I second. Okay, I heard Miss uh, motion by Cantu, second by Hanson. Any further discussion or questions from colleagues? If not, all in favor? Aye. Okay, I heard everyone. That's seven, zero. Takes us to item nine D, consideration and approval of 2020-21 stipends. Before we get into this item, um, Ms. Baez and I, I was, I had a work commitment and missed agenda prep where I'm sure this was discussed, but are these stipends scheduled to be paid out whether the work duty happens or not? For instance, with fall sports that we don't yet know we're going to play, if we approve the stipend, will we be obligated contractually? So the plan is uh, that the stipends are annualized and the plan is yes. Okay. And is there anything that it would disrupt if we delay either approval of these stipends or approve the stipends and delay their implementation um, until we saw if we were going to be ha allowed to have UIO supports and other activities? Yes, sir. We can do that. Okay. All right, that may have come up at agenda prep, as I said, I wasn't here, but um, I'm uncomfortable approving 1.5 million if we don't know those tasks will exist, at least for the coming school year. I think the stipend schedule is reasonable and well thought out, but um, we're already obligated contractually to pay a lot of money one way or the other. Uh, and this seems like something we could wait on. Mr. McLaughlin. Sure, Mr. Adonis. Um, thank you. Um, similarly uh, to President McLaughlin, I think there are a lot of unknown um, variables to take into consideration with this item. I'm comfortable approving the stipend schedule as proposed um, with the suggested increases in the various areas. However, as of right now, knowing the only thing that's going to take place is the academic instruction and portion of these stipends. I would be comfortable as an individual trustee approving that those take effect going into next academic year with this vote. However, I would also um, want to hold off on the other stipends that are, pen are, are pending what happens moving forward into the future. Ms. Cantu? I think you might be muted, Ms. Kintu. Sorry. I have a question after her. Okay. So, Mr. Arredondo, you're saying approve only academic stipends and not athletic stipends, or are you talking about the fine arts, the choir, the dance? What? What's? How can? Where's the split? 
any type of academic core curriculum instruction, so special education, math, things of that nature, things that are going to be any type of academic instruction, nothing extracurricular. Okay, I heard Ms. Hansen had a question, and then I'll come to you, Ms. Halsey. Ms. Hansen? Ms. Myers, when is the last date that we need uh, to have these stipends approved? Mr. Barton, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think we have until June or July, so the new budget. They will be a part of our compensation package to teachers, so we would not want to approve our budget on ju June 1 without this approved. Okay, Ms. Halsey? Um, wouldn't it be possible for us to go ahead and approve all of the stipends as recommended, but then under the under the um, under a rule that would say that they weren't paid out until that activity commenced. So if your activity wasn't scheduled until February, that stipend didn't show up until your February paycheck. Or if, if the activity started in August, then it would come in August. Can we um, assign the payment to the schedule of the activity? I think that's a good idea. That way, if they're not expended during the year, if those activities aren't able to be held, then we can return the, that money to fund balance. But in the meantime, if something is going to get going in July, because we're opening up and you know they start having track practice, then that uh, instructor or coach can be paid what they're owed. That would be my so, preference. I would, I would support that motion, um, you know, so long as admin can figure out a way to implement. <laughs> Mr. Arredondo? I have a motion if no one has any questions. All right, we'll try it. Okay, here we go. Um, I move that the board approve the stipend schedule as presented, the delay implementation of all extracurricular stipends until uh, the district determines that event is going to take place. I've second that. Okay. Mr. Arredondo, and we have Ms. Halsey. I have a quick. Well, I think they're suggesting that once it commences, that we would pay. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Arredondo? Is that the spirit of your motion? Uh, yes. So obviously, instruction is going to take place in core curriculum areas, education, so on and so forth. Um, and we can competently say that regardless of the form of instruction that takes place, it's going to happen. Um, but again, similarly, uh, fall sports, spring sports, to be determined what it's going to look like. Same thing with extracurriculars. So um, that's the spirit of my motion. Okay. Ms. Halsey? And I would also hope that that would give um, administration some flexibility in terms of determining, like, you know, there's some, there's might be some activities that really cannot have an online iteration, but something like a cross country team might be able to not get together and practice and compete, but they might be able, the coach might be able to do additional things with students. So I would hope that administration would use some flexibility in determining whether or not that activity is proceeding. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Um, if we, I have two questions. If we approve this, uh, Mr. Barton, would this cause problems with the budget? No, it won't cause problems with the budget to the finance office. There will be some challenges and be some challenges in the human resources team as they figure out how to, um, uh, it's not a word, uh, de-annualize these stipends. There right now, um, let's say a, a varsity coach at high school, um, that those are the stipends that look to be the most affected by this. Um, what, uh, all year long, probably about six thousand uh, dollars would be a small stipend. There, um, we would put that in their check all the way along, and that's not an insignificant amount of money. But right. then, um, if we tried to take that out and pay it just at one lump sum at one time, I'm sure that would be a blessing that month. But that would sure change that employee's uh, life right now, um, and that that would be my only caution, word of caution on that issue. Although I, I do understand the spirit of what you guys are saying. Thank you. Okay. 
Any other questions from colleagues? Yes, Mr. Barton, um, following up on Ms. Hansen's uh, question, and I was really probably more addressed to Ms. Baez, and that's in regards to those contracts. So these stipends, how does that come into play with uh, those contracts for teachers that have a stipend, or is it included in the contract? Is it uh, 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 attached to it or a part of the contract as far as the stipend is concerned? No, ma'am, it's not attached to the contract. It's separate. Um, so, and they're reviewed, they are, stipends should be reviewed annually. That's one of the recommendations um, moving forward. Um, and with mm -hmm. regard to annualizing the stipend, um, it's like Mr. Barton said, either annualize it or we can prorate maybe stipends per semester twice a year. That's what the board chooses to do. Okay. That would be my preference if we could do it twice a year because then people would get it you know, in their uh, monthly uh, pay. Okay, Mr. Arredondo. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Barton and yeah, Dr. Baez for weighing in on this. Obviously, we're, we all find ourselves in uncertain times and as information and data comes from the state, we can accommodate and modify um, tonight's direction if it does pass. I think um, something to take into consideration is in regards to these stipends, they were annualized this past budget year and continue to um, fulfill that financial obligation and commitment to ISD staff when the things drastically change. And I hope people understand that moving forward, because we don't know what's going to happen, that we're going to have to make some changes when it comes to items such as this. Um, but as we are now in June, we have two months before the August paycheck comes around. So hopefully by that time we have better data and information if we need to go back and annualize the stipends again or not. That's okay. It. There's nothing further. We got a motion and a second. We can vote it. All in favor? Three, three, four, five. And Ms. Costilla. Uh, I Ms. Hanson, I cannot see you, or, uh, but mm -hmm. all opposed? Again. Okay, all opposed. against? Okay, so that's carry 6-1 with Hanson against. That takes us to item 9E, consideration and approval of a general pay increase for 2020-21, and this is on page 43 of the board book. Again, Ms. Bias? I'm going to take this one, sir. Oh, okay, um, man, y'all got me jumping. All right, that's great. That's okay. Uh, on page 44 is where I'd like to read from if trustees have their board book. Um, we were asked to provide five different salary scenarios at our last budget workshop, and I'll read through them quickly here. Salary scenario one does not include a general pay increase at this time, and it has us with a deficit, a projected deficit of $291,998. Salary scenario two would be a 1% pay increase for teachers, that's about $500 a 1% pay increase for administrators, and a 25% increase for paraprofessional, clerical, and manual trades. That would be at a cost of about $666,201, and we would have a budget deficit projected at around $958,199 for this year. Scenario three is a teacher 1% pay increase, an admin 1% pay increase, and a 50 cent increase prepare professional, clerical, and manual trades. That would be an, an expenditure of $844,000. And that would leave us with a budget deficit of $1.1 million, and just over. Salary scenario four would be a 1.5% increase for teachers, a 1.5% increase for administrators, and about 50 cents, I'm sorry, exactly 50 cent increase for paraprofessional, clerical, and manual trades. That would be expenditures of $1,090,947. And that would leave us with a budget deficit of $1.3 million. Finally, salary scenario five is a teacher 1% pay increase, an admin 1% pay increase, and paraprofessional clerical manual trades increase of $1. That would require expenditures of $1,231,635.
additional. And our budget deficit would be projected to be around $1,523,633. It's the administration's recommendation that given the great uncertainty right now um, with the state, not only for next year, but the biennium after we have three years of downturn ahead of us, it's our recommendation to not approve a general pay increase and instead to look for a one-time supplement to all employees about no, next November to be paid out hopefully in December. Uh, and the trustees can pick that amount of money based on the revenue that you see and the situation that you see at that time. Uh, you'll definitely have more information in November about next year and the two years after than you have right now. Um, I have a motion. Go ahead, Ms. Hanson. I move that we approve scenario one, where uh, everything is frozen and looking at a stipend in at our November board meeting. Okay, I have a motion by Hanson. Miss um, Cantu, you're muted. I, I can. I saw Cantu, Arredondo, Halsey. Go ahead, Miss Cantu. I just have a question. So her motion is no increase except for the stipend in November. Am I hearing it correctly? Correct. That's what scenario one says. And yes. is, did you say, did you specify $500? I didn't specify amount. I just said we would look at a stipend in November. I think we would have better information as to the amount at that time than we do right now. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hernando. Um, uh, thank you, President McLaughlin. Um, I, in its current, I know it hasn't gotten a second yet, uh, but in its current form without a predetermined amount um, with that stipend, I can't support this motion as stated. So. Okay, Ms. Halsey. I, I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off, Mr. Adanda. Did you have more? I'm just, I don't want us to leave it. In. I think we need to commit to staff in some way, shape or form today we say that we're approving a general pay increase, then I think we should give an amount. We know that it's potentially gonna be a withdrawal from fund balance. That's the, I guess the rationale or the logic behind not giving a pay increase is because a stipend will be a one-time thing. So we know what that withdrawal is gonna be if revenue remains flat, um, which based on Mr. Barton's assessment and I think a number of folks in school finances, it's not going to be a good forecast. So I think it's, I think we can say it's going to be a withdrawal from fund balance and we should approve that amount tonight. Okay, Ms. Halsey? Yeah, I have two questions. The first is for Mr. Barton, just to make sure that the spreadsheet that we received um, with these designees does not include the $4.5 million that we just returned to fund balance, correct? If you mean by stipends, it does have the projected stipends. No, I'm talking about the scenarios. The scenario, the fund balance, if we, the bottom line on each of the fund balances in the scenario spreadsheet shows the old fund balance, not the new one, which includes the $4.5 million we just returned. Yes, ma'am. We will update that uh, after this evening. Okay, that's my first question. My second question is, Mr. President, which, um, what procedures are you following here and calling on people? Because I've had my hand up multiple times, and I've also done the more thing with the hand, the virtual hand raise. And I feel like I've gotten skipped over because I had a motion to make before Ms. Hansen. I have not seen your reaction. Is that the hand thing you're talking about? I haven't seen yeah. that at all. I, I'm just, as I see y'all's hands or hear someone, I'm recognizing them in the order that I see. But you couldn't have possibly seen Ms. Hansen's hand before mine. She's not on video. I heard her. I didn't see her hand. Right, did, I heard her before I saw your hand. I have, I, I, I have an objection to the, to the procedural actions here. Would you like me to make a note of your objection? Please. Okay, noted. Anything else? All right, if there's not a second for Ms. Hansen's motion, I'll entertain an alternate motion. Mr. Arredondo, I saw your hand first, go ahead. Um, thank you, President McLaughlin. If my colleagues would like to refer to um, the handout provided by Mr. Barton in regards to um, the different costs for each individual scenario. I'm going to move that the board approve a 50 cent per hour increase for all hourly employees. 
I'll second. Okay. A motion and a second. I see your hand up. Is that for something in alternative to the second, Ms. Halsey? Nope. Okay, I'm gonna lower it just so that. Oh, sorry, it was from before. Pull oh, the motion. It, it cut off in my hand. The motion is a. Oh, I want to co-host. All right. We we're remedying this. I Mr. am now a co-host. Well, hold on, hold on, Miss Garcia. I want to answer Miss Halsey's concern before. I do not believe I was a co-host before Miss Halsey, so I wasn't able to see your reaction. But they've added me, so now I can. If you use that function again, okay? Thank you very much. Sure, Miss Costilla. What was the motion? It was cut off. I didn't hear anything that was said from Mr. Adelando. It was a standalone 50 cent increase for paraprofessional and clerical, leaving the teacher and admin for a later motion. Correct, Mr. Adelando? Yes, President McLaughlin. All right. Um, I have a question when you get to it. Yeah, okay, Ms. Hanson. I'm just curious what that total cost is. Ma'am, the cost for a 50 cent increase for paraprofessional clerical and manual trades is $376,953. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? If not, we've got a motion and a second. And we can vote on the 50 cent. Mr. Aradon, do you have further input? Um, yes, I just wanted to explain to my colleagues uh, my rationale behind this. Um, I think in the last several months, we've seen our hourly employees included with everyone else go above and beyond. And I just can't in good um, conscience not approve a salary increase for this uh, subset of population. Similarly, I'm gonna advocate um, for teachers and administrators on separate votes and motions, but I thought it would be more palatable for us to take it line by line. And that's why I pulled this group out specifically. Okay. Uh, we've got a motion and a second. Motion by Donna, second by Halsey to increase manual clerical by 50 cents per hour. Um, all in favor? Are, are we going this line by line for increases? Or is that it was how the, yeah, that's how the motion was made. It was broken out the one subgroup of the three total subgroups. Okay, so we're not finished with the rest of it. This, this is just one part of it. That's correct. That they're separate, just that it's being separated. Is that that's, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so rather than voting on a whole bunch, so a whole packet, we're just voting on right now on an increase for our hourly employees. Is that correct? That was the motion. Okay. What was the count? It, I, I haven't seen Ms. Costilla's vote yet. I have five in favor. And um, I will support that. Okay. So that's six. All opposed? Me, I'm opposed because I don't like it separated out. All right. Gotcha. Ms. Hanson. So that carries 6-1. Someone want to make a motion with regard to teachers and administration? Ms. Halsey has her hand Ms. up. Ms. Halsey, go ahead. Thank you. I, I apologize. I understand that this is an awkward format and I appreciate you getting into the situation where we can see, maybe as we continue this, we should set up parameters about whether or not we're raising hands or we're speaking or we're using the signals. I think it would be great if we all had a common understanding. Um, that said, I'd like to propose that we uh, give uh, teachers and administrators a 1% increase next year. That's my amendment, my motion. Oh. Okay, there's a motion for um, Ms. Halsey for a 1% raise for teachers and administration. Anyone want to second that? I'll second, second by Arredondo. So motion by Halsey, second by Arredondo. Mr. Barton, the cost of this? A 1% pay raise for teachers is $378,000 and a 1% pay increase for administrators is $94,000. And it looks like this is scen scenario Number three. three. So the, right. total, the total change in fund balance with current revenue projections is about a $1.1 $1 million deficit. Is that correct, Mr. One. Burton? Yes, sir. Okay. Any further questions? Mr. McLaughlin, so, yes. so we're actually, 
even though we separated, we actually approved scenario three. Well, we haven't approved this motion yet, but. I'm just saying that if it goes that direction, that's what we're doing. We're doing the 1.1%, 1% and 50 cents, basically. It's just, yeah. It looks like it was, sep well, it was separated, but we're going in that direction. Okay. The end result so, would be so the same. And I just want to emphasize, Mr. McLaughlin, I just want to emphasize that um, given Mr. Barton's statement regarding the next two years, this is going to be a reoccurring cost. Uh, I'm not for not giving raises to our employees. Uh, I just want to emphasize that this is a reoccurring cost. It's not just something like a stipend or a supplement, whatever you want to call it, that, um, that we're talking about. Next year, we will be, that amount will be added to the deficit budget, 1.136 to 63. So there's really no difference. Uh, I think I said that the last time that I would be more supportive of, of a one-time thing. I did ask Mr. Barton what the impact would be if we did not get on the compression schedule that we have. And it wasn't so much a, a, a great concern because we could go back to restarting it. But I just feel it important that it, we understand that this is going to be a recurring cost. Nobody wants us not to give teachers a raise or administrators. We know that that um, they all have worked very hard for that, and they deserve one. But um, you know, I looked at the, I did find out and figure out what that one percent would be, and over a ninth or twelve month period of time, there's really not much of an increase that an employee is getting. That they may be gotten a seven hundred and fifty supplement in November or even a thousand dollar supplement that would have been a one-time cost. It would have been like close to a million, a little over a million, and it was still giving them a lot more money during that period of time than what maybe this increase is going to give them. Um, I'm, I'm here to support our teachers, but once again, it's going to impact our budget for next year. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Castillo, I mean, I, I'm in favor of this motion. I'm going to vote in favor of this motion. I do understand it's a recurring cost, um, but I, I think the board's being, you know, attuned to our uncertain finance by being more reserved in the amount of raises. And the and the reason we can do this is because we've been able to be more generous in past years or we had more favorable budget cycles. And we're heading into an unknown, but we're not heading into a off a known cliff yet. <laughs> And if, if next year's budget may be awful, we may be in so much red that we won't have the luxury to do this. So um, I, I understand that it is a recurring cost, but 1% um, is reasonable in my estimation. Mr. Arredondo? Um, similarly to um, President McLaughlin, right now we have the ability and the resources to provide this, knowing that we are going into uncertain times. I guess the way that I look at this tonight is when we, if we approve this, we're going to have to have conversations in the future if the budget outlook is as dire um, as it's projected to be. And that's why, like Mr. McLaughlin said, I'm supportive of a more modest increase for all staff, knowing that you know, had someone made a person to set a $15 hour minimum hourly rate for employees, had a larger um, percentage increase for teachers and administrators that's going to be a conversation in the future of cut those hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars from other areas um, and I think we're still going to have to have that conversation in the future but hopefully not as um, consequential um, so that's why I'm su supportive of Miss Halsey's motion tonight. Mr. Ms. Cantu, I, I saw your hand. Ms. Can, I saw Miss Cantu and then we'll come to you Miss Costilla. Go right. ahead Miss Cantu. That's fine. I think because this is a difficult, difficult budgetary time for us because of the pandemic, I think that we are better off doing the one-time stipend and offering it for the fall, November, December time period. And then if we have enough money, maybe we can give them an equal amount for the spring. That's just my opinion. One trustee. Okay, okay. Ms. Costilla. I was just going to <clears throat> reiterate uh, that I am not against a increase or whether it's a stipend or increase for our employees. I think that 
we have continued to show them that. All I was saying is that given my experience on this board and what has happened in the past and our present situation and where we're at, that just looking at the even the amount that um, that would not be much, it's not gonna be much for them to see at the end when they do get paid and that versus a one-time amount that they probably would be very much more able to utilize than on a long-term basis when it also impacts, since it's a reoccurring cost. That's all I was making reference to in regards to that. I said it last time and I said, I said it again this time that I even mentioned a $1,000, which was, I think they calculated that the last time that was going to be a, a one point something million cost, a one time cost for this year, if we did that, that we wouldn't have, that would not be added for next year. Because once again, we're probably, we might have to be in the same situation as far as look and um, compensating our employees in some form or fashion. That's all I make reference to. I realize where y'all at and that um, uh, we all want to show our employees that they're appreciated. I do too. But I think even Ms. Susan Seaton made reference to the fact that they understand. And even a one-time cost, I think, would be something very much appreciated, especially in November or December. That's all I said. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Ardondo, I see your hand. Um, yes, Mrs. Walton, thank you so much. I apologize for not mentioning this earlier, um, but I wanted to um, remind my colleagues that several budget cycles ago, we spent a significant sum of money to address depression and issues that have taken place during similar um, financial forecasts and budget years. And my concern or another reason why I am supporting uh, Ms. Halsey's motion is those expenditures and that work and effort and that energy will be all for naught, in my opinion, um, because what we are doing tonight, only approving a stipend would be a doing um, that will to address um, compression, which again came at a significant cost and financial commitment to the ISD. So even if Ms. Halsey's motion does not pass, I would hope that the board would entertain, again, sometimes it's a half percent again some um so that work to address compression in our salary and hiring schedules is not um all for naught thank you mr McLaughlin. sure i see miss halsey's hand go ahead miss halsey and me too okay i'll get you next miss hansen thank you um the reason that i am uh, motioning now for a salary increase is because i think that our employees deserve that kind of assuredness in their futures that some of them are nearing retirement and so their salaries will go into that calculation for their retirement um, but I would not be opposed to also doing a one-time stipend um, whether or not we would make that motion tonight to look at that during the year or if we would just agree that we would take that up um, during the year if the financial forecasts change and we feel like that we can um, we can afford that so okay Miss Hanson um, I concur with Ms. Costia and Ms. Cantu's comment in that I feel like we could provide a larger amount as a stipend in November. Okay, I think we've heard from everyone. Mr. We have McLaughlin, a motion. Okay, yes, Ms. Costia. Can I ask another question? Could, um, we asked Mr. Barton, uh, I know that the issue has been compression scale. I know I, I very much understand that. But at the same time, um, I think I would like to ask Mr. Barton, what would be the impact on we being Mr. Arnaldo has made has noted that we work real hard, we work real hard to put where we are as far as that compression. So what would be the impact, Mr. Barton, regarding that if we were to look at only for maybe even this year, only a stipend? Living everything as it is, like the administration is recommending. Uh, for freezing what it is and then providing them a stipend. What is the impact if we don't go with anything regarding a particular increase to our administrators or our teachers? Well, first of all, I would say uh, Trustee Arredondo is right. Uh, this will create compression. Um, we would look at hopefully um, 
a small step for zero year teachers so that next year's zero year teachers aren't the exact same. Uh, again, that'd be a hundred, two hundred dollars. It'd be very small. Um, but this would have to be something that is corrected in a future pay raise. And so mm -hmm. probably not in the next biennium, but in the one after, there's going to have to be a pay raise that's just part of our structure now. And it would have to be corrected there and it would cost money. Uh, we are recommending a really conservative path right now because of the unknowns. And the best case scenario uh, right now uh, with a general pay increase is that we come back here this time next year and we're starting at that amount of deficit. Uh, and so that would be our best case scenario. The worst case scenario is something that our teachers and our administrators have gone through this year, which is having to figure out how to reduce. And that was mentioned also that the district will adapt to this by, um, by finding efficiencies and reducing in other areas. And uh, that's true, we will. And that will be a, a, a loss of some services, uh, maybe a loss of some personnel. Everything we did this year when we were looking at an $8.3 million deficit, we evaluated every opportunity that came up. And uh, we would have to look for efficiencies on the scale of about $1.3 million uh, this year and moving forward. Uh, and then bring those to the, the board next year at budget time, uh, just like we did this year uh, in closing a lot of this gap. So uh, it, is a, it isn't a win in either direction. It's a challenge in either direction. It's a challenge for an organization to be in deficit. Um, but it, we, will, we will find a way through it, whichever way the trustees recommend. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Wharton. Any further questions or discussion on the pending motion? By Ms. Halsey, seconded by Redondo. Okay, um, seeing none, we can vote. Um, all in favor? One, two, three, four, with the Apondo. Opposed? Me. Uh, Me, two, opposed. Hansen and Costilla. Okay, that motion will carry 4-3. And we'll complete item 9F and take us down to item, excuse me, uh, that's item 9E. And now we'll go to item 9F, consideration and approval of CPR waivers for seniors. Mm -hmm. Yes, school districts are required to provide CPR instruction to seniors prior to graduation. We had that date scheduled for March the 25th. Due to COVID-19, we were unable to fulfill that obligation. So we are requesting a waiver from TEA. Okay, do we have a motion? Okay. Motion by Via Pondo. I'll second. Second by Hanson to waive uh, for approval to apply for a CPR waiver for seniors. Uh, any discussion? Comment seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Is me as well. Ms. Costi, I, I uh, opposed? Oh, four. All right. So, thank you. Seven zero carries. Uh, that takes us to item 9G, consideration and approval of instructional continuity while closed attestation on page 46 of your board book. Yes, this is just a missed school days waiver. It just ensures that we were providing instructional continuity during the time that schools were closed. The way we provided that instructional continuity was through our high tech option of remote learning and also through our packets that were delivered to households and also kept on campuses and in our newspaper dispensers throughout um, every two weeks. I move that we yes. approve this. Okay, Ms. Hansen with the motion. Mr. Arredondo with the second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Uh, seeing none, we can vote this. All in favor? Aye. Indicate in some manner. Opposed? Okay, that carries. None opposed. Uh, takes us to item 9H, consideration and approval of SHAC members for 2020-21 school year. This is on page 47 of the board book. Yes, uh, Mr. Ed Rios will present the names to you um, for this year's approval. Yes, uh, <clears throat> as a result of our annual process, uh, we present the SHAC candidate recommendations for appointment for the 2020-2021 school year 
Uh, these can be found on page 47 in your board book. All of these candidates followed the application process and were evaluated and considered based on our member composition as outlined by the Texas Shack. The candidates are district employee, Lisa Mazur, non-parent, Bethany Diaz, who's a nutritionalist, and the district parents, Christian Watkins, Mary Gutierrez, Patricia Alvarado, and Valerie Gomez. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to working with our new SHAC team members. And I'll take any questions if you have any. All right, thank you, Mr. Rios. Mr. Arredondo, I don't know if he has a question or a motion. Go ahead. I believe you might be muted. Sorry. Um, I have it's okay, it makes me feel better when someone else <laughs> misses for a minute. My millennial card is going to get pulled since I messed it yeah. up. Um, yeah, no, I'd like to. I'd like to make a motion that the board approve uh, the appointees to the shop as presented by Mr. Rios and the administration. Okay. I'll second. Uh, a motion by Arredondo, second by Cantu, to approve the new members as provided. Any further question or discussion? Okay, seeing none. All in favor? If you could indicate in some manner. Aye. Okay, that's all of us. That'll carry 7-0. We've really picked up our pace. We're on item 9-I, consideration and approval of resolution of the Board of Trustees of SMCISD to end emergency school closure for staff and personnel. I saw Ms. Halsey's hand indicator. Go ahead, Ms. Halsey. Sorry, I had a question for the last item to the superintendent. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, the SHAC report included information about uh, the fact that we weren't able to complete the sexual education curriculum during the school year. And so I'm wondering, because my understanding is that most of that curriculum is included in the biology course, how are we planning to go back and catch up students who didn't, who finished the biology course this year without that part of the curriculum? And Ms. Halsey, this is Monica Reese. Uh -huh. And we'll go ahead and we'll catch it up next year. The portion that is not um, being covered because of COVID-19, Ms. Vogel, you can also jump in. It's the portion that we provide in middle schools during, uh, after the conclusion of the STAR end of course exams. So it was the middle school curriculum. Am I correct on that, Jennifer? Yes, so I, that is correct. And I do think some, <laughs> It's done across the science. It's not just done in biology in high school. It's all, everybody taking a science course in May. So we can so, embed that into the next year's scope and sequence. Yes. That would be great because I think that's really critical um, that we don't lose students because of this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that takes us back to, I think we, we had a, uh, Mr. Arredondo, you would raise your hand. Go ahead. Um, thank you, President McLaughlin. I had a question and a follow-up um, for Mr. Wozniak, or if the superintendent has this information. It was said that um, we were going to require staff as they return to campus during the summer um, to wear um, masks and other items, personal protection equipment. Were we going to have those materials and those things for staff when, when are we going to have those materials available to them? That's my question. Well, we ordered almost everything we can, and, and currently um, we've outfitted um, child nutrition and transportation, and I believe we have enough for maintenance. So we're looking at a combination of um, the mask, either either the disposable ones or the homemade ones, and we continue to go out for, um, for um, donations also. We made a trip to Austin about two or three weeks ago and got um, – about 50 homemade masks and 100 face shields. So um, we're continuing to kind of combo it with um, whatever we can order, whatever they allow us to order. And then um, what we get um, from donations as well as, I've also gotten some donations from the city. If you have a follow up, Mr. Adunda, then I'm gonna go to Ms. Halsey. Um, thank you. Uh, so at this point in time, um, unless we were able to one, make it a mandatory, um, for staff, well, one, I'd be supportive of making it mandatory for staff that whether public or private in any way, shape, or form that we have employees wearing uh, personal protection equipment while 
um, asking them to return to in-person work. I um, mean, until we guarantee that the ISD provides that for staff, I am hesitant to approve um, this order. I'm willing to do that this evening. We set a date at which time ISD can commit to having those items for staff members. Okay, Ms. Halsey. Um, I agree with what uh, Mr. Adondo just said. And also I'm wondering if we are um, looking at ways that we can provide flexibility to our employees so that they can do voluntary work from home when their situation allows them to do that um, and how that is progressing because I feel very uncomfortable mandating everybody return um, on June 1st. My understanding, and, and I'd have to, um, you know, talk to Mr. Cardona about this again, but that the uh, the customized um, way that we're doing business right now would continue with the exception of the employees whose job description says that they have to be here in person. That's a whole nother discussion, but we do have some um, central office employees that will continue to work at home from June in June. Um, and then we also have some other employees that, you know, as far as like maintenance workers, um that that cannot work from home as it stands right now we we believe that we have have enough masks to outfit everybody right now as far as as june is concerned um the important point to remember is that june will not look a whole lot different than it does now you've got um you know you, you're not going to really add or subtract any child nutrition workers you're keeping um for the most part the same amount of transportation workers with the exception of maybe uh, four or five supervisors that will come back. Um, your custodial staff roughly looks the same in June as it does right now, and um, maintenance roughly looks the same. So we're really not adding or subtracting a whole lot in June. So, so our June operations will look very similar to, to what they do right now. So the June operations will look similar to what they are now, except that we will be paying people less money to do the jobs than we're paying them to do now, even though the numbers in Hayes County are continuing to increase and it's quite likely that we are not through the worst of this yet. That's my concern. So I, I would be in favor of continuing as we're doing now with the additional hazard pay. We have currently uh, two departments that, um, that won't necessarily be true. Um, one being child nutrition, when um, when they get their um, summer pay for what what they do as far as the, the summer deliver all that kind of summer delivery stuff, they actually will make more in the summer than they do now with the premium pay, as well as my drivers on Fridays, um, when they uh, work now, you know they're getting premium pay, but in the summer they actually get their their hourly rate. So for two of our departments, we won't necessarily save money. I'm, I'm confused because I'm not particularly interested in this instance in saving money. I'm interested in making sure that we're most fairly compensating our employees when we're asking them to do what is dangerous work. Um, and so explain to me, Mr. Wozniak, again, so what would an hourly employee in transportation or child nutrition be making now and as opposed to what they would be making in June if we, if we eliminate this res this order well uh, a, a let's say a transportation employee makes 16 dollars an hour now and they come in and work uh four hours on a friday they're going to roughly make 16 and 8 right they're going to roughly make 24 uh, dollars an hour for that where in the in the summertime they're going to get their annualized pay and then when we bring them in they they get their full 16 dollars an hour which in, in most of our summers, if you recall, we bring in teams to do um, cleaning and, and um, um, training and things like that. So our transportation employees would actually make more in the summer than they do now for premium pay. And Mike told me this morning that it's kind of the same for his, um, for his people when they get their summer pay. Their summer pay is a little bit more, will come out a little bit more than what they make now with the premium pay. Does that make, because that kind of answer your question? I mean, it does, it just, it's confusing um, how that yes. works out. And why then, if that's the case, then why wouldn't the hazard pay in the summer be even a, an additional to that, right? Like that would seem 
to follow that logic for me. But well, I think because when we when we begin our summer hours again, there, there no longer is hazard pay. We're just back to our summer um, days as far as contract, what everybody's you know supposed to work, which is you know varies from two twenty six to two forty to two to two. Whatever. Right. No, I totally understand that that's what you're saying, but I'm saying that's what we do under normal circumstances. Correct. And so we would be doing this under very abnormal circumstances. Um, so I would think the fair thing would actually be to pay them hazard pay on what their summer salaries would be, but I don't know what that number looks like. Um, and I also still hold that this is, that it's too soon to sort of make this move. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the entire workforce, you know, is returning to work. Our, we've had the luxury uh, and our employees have had the luxury of an extended break, almost all of them, with no pay disruption, whereas a quarter of our town lost their job. So I, I trust the administration to bring people back in a responsible manner, to abide by social distancing, to use, to encourage and insist on masks um, in all circumstances. And, and handle things responsibly, but I don't want to tie their hands about who they can bring back or who they can't bring back by an artificial emergency school closure order um, once you know we're already in the process of reopening. Mr. Arredondo? Um, thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Just as a clarifying point, is this a financial decision? You're just asking us to weigh the time and a half hazard pay. I'm just, again, just as a, as a clarifying question, I'm confused if this is a combination of we think it's safe to return to work, and because of that, we're going to do a couple of things to make sure employees stay safe, and then separately, because the hazard or what have you is over, um, or because we're protecting employees, we don't have to pay them this additional money, or is it both? I'm just trying to understand what you're asking us to do or what flexibility or, or powers you're asking us to re-grant you or reauthorize you. We're asking you just to vote to bring back our hourly employees in a safe manner following the Texas Department of Health guideline. You know, when they're on a hazard duty pay, they work less hours, they'll work more hours, but we'll keep the same safeguards in place for them. We're asking you to let us do our business and trust us to do it right is what we're asking. Absolutely. Um, and just as a follow-up, I guess my concern is, and again, I'm supportive of the superintendent and the administration. Um, in conversations, we talked about um, the difficulties of ensuring safety when it comes to an in-person graduation and Superintendent Cardona. Preface that at the beginning of his meet of our meeting during his update and similarly, Personally, individually, I think it's too early for everyone to return to work. I know the university has said that instruction um, and most staff do not have to return until after summer one, which is kind of in line with the timeline of us waiting until um, we are ready to host an in-person graduation. Um, again, my biggest concern is just that until we provide staff with, you know, until we know how serious this might get as we all reopen the state, like Mr. McLaughlin said, if we have the opportunity to keep employees home and they can complete their job while at home, I would hope that we could have a modified um, amendment to that original vote. Um, and I understand that employees who can work from home are going to be allowed to do that. Um, but again, when we look at several months, I had asked the administration and district leaders if we were going to make it mandatory that people 65 and older or in some at-risk populations were going to stay home. And I was told, yes, that that's what this policy, when voted on, was going to do. And I see on social media that those very same employees I asked about were given the option, they so chose to, to return to work, which was, at least based on what I had heard, was incongruent with what I thought was going to happen. And so maybe again, that was them as an individual employee. I have, you know, concerns about that. And so that's why, again, I'm hesitant to 
about um, tonight's vote. Ms. Costilla, I think I saw your hand and then I'll go to Ms. Hansen. Yes. Um, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, I, I support um, your statement regarding going forward with with the recommendation of the of the administration as far as um, closing it out as the way it's placed. The only thing, the only reservation I'd have at this point in time is that I just want to make sure that all the employees will have the PPE that that is needed whenever that does come to flourishion as far as maybe participation the first. I, I just want to make sure that they, I have no, um, uh, no doubt and I have all the confidence that uh, our administration will not put our, our employees in any kind of uh, safe, um, dangerous when it comes to health environments. I really do trust their actions and I support that. But I also want to make sure that our that our employees will be safe regarding the necessary things that they might need as far as PPE is concerned. Okay, Ms. Hanson. Yeah, my concern is similar, and I'm sure Mr. Uh, Cardona will will take care of this. But I'm just concerned about people working in offices, especially at central office, where it's in mm -hmm. some instances they're unable to social distance because of where they're cubicles are uh, located. Central Office HR and Finance have already worked out a rotation where certain departments are in the building at certain times. So we would continue that practice as we would our other departments where that's the case. Thank you. Let's see Ms. Halsey's hand and then we go to you, Mr. Arredondo. Thank you. Thanks. I had another question about how we in plan to enforce the use of the PPEs because I'm, um, I'm afraid to say that I have this week seen school employees on school campuses not using PPE um, in contact with children, pro proximity. So I know that everybody has the best intentions and everybody wants to do the right thing here and everybody wants to make sure everybody's safe, but that's very difficult in this very political and very divisive culture that we are currently in. And I would like to know how we can plan to enforce that because it just seems highly problematic to me. Well, so, once we put the guidelines in place, they're gonna to have to follow them that Mr. Wozniak's gonna to send to you. Remember teachers go off contract on June 1st, so they're gonna be at home. But, you know, as we work through summer school, and there may be a period of time we have to bring some teachers up to work through that logistics. And so we would set that forth in the campus principals who are running summer schools. You know, it's their responsibility to make sure that everybody follows either wearing a face shield or face covering or a, a mask. And Mr. Fernandez has ordered 2,500 of those so that every employee and board members will get some here in the future so that we can model that behavior. And it'll be a Rattler logo too. I think that's- Mr. Arredondo. Um, I have a motion. Um, I move that the board end the emergency school closure for staff and personnel as recommended by the administration, but any eligible employee as at risk be afforded the opportunities and benefits that were allowed during the school closure um, until July, um, July 6th. Second. Okay, what does that mean? So we, we asked everyone to come back as the administration sees fit, right? Um, uh -huh. They have the power to do that. However, if you're 65 and older or you have some type of immune compromised system or whatever that is as CDC kind of noted and that the administration is following that they are allowed to utilize work from home, time and a half that benefits them if they're called into work in person or whatever that looks like. 
So if you're in an at-risk population and we ask you to come back and continue your work, we afford you those opportunities and benefits and that compensation. Just for I, the population. But that's yeah, the I, mean, I think I was fine with everything in the motion except the optional time and a half for high-risk people. I don't think I want to encourage those that are at highest risk to rush back to work to make more. So similarly, I agree, and I don't want them to. I would hope that the administration would not call them in. But if for whatever reason, John, you have to come in today, then you choose so. And I don't know how to manage that, but I guess that's what I'm, I guess my goal or intent was. If I say, Mr. McLaughlin, you have to come into work today, you have to complete this task, you're an at-risk employee. I would hope that I could provide you that benefit. So I don't know how to manage that individual situation because I similarly don't want staff to take advantage of it or utilize that benefit. But that's at least my intent was if we ask them to come back because they have to, that we give them that option. Okay, I think Ms. Viopondo has a question. I see your hand in my peripheral. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure what Mr. Mr. Redondo's motion. And so are we not supposed to approve the order that's on here, the resolution for the Board of Trustees? It's not, it, or I don't know where this action is coming from. Well, I think he wanted to approve it with the single condition, as I heard it, that high risk folks in over 65 or other high risk groups would continue to benefit as they are be have the option of staying away or if not benefit to the same degree they did through the end of june did i get that right um yeah if it, if it benefits the board for conversation i'm willing to amend that and say that we don't provide that financial benefit and they're just not allowed to come back to work but we protect their employment and they continue to get paid without having to tell them that either. I mean, if they're 65, they're like, they're an adult, they can evaluate their risks and I'm not going to ban them because of their age. I don't know. It's also important to remember too, whether they're at risk or not, when they come into work, like we said, they're either going to fill out a checklist or they're going to go over it with their supervisor or they're going to verify that they don't meet certain criteria they meet one of those criteria and you'll see on that it's it's everywhere right on all the cdc sites it says cough persistent this pers you know you get sent home immediately upon that and then there's protocols in place after that where you're allowed to return to work if you've met a b and c so dr Baez and i are working on that right now to um to actually provide a training um for our employees if they're allowed to return in june so that they know their rights um, as far as leave and FMLA and the, the new, what is it, e, e FMLA, extended FMLA. So uh, yeah, yeah. Our hoops too. Thank you, Mr. Wozniak. I see a host of hands. I saw Costilla, Cantu, Arredondo. Uh, Ms. Costilla? Uh, if Mr. Arredondo's intent is to provide additional time to those individuals that are higher risk, uh, why don't, why can't we just add on that we're approving the um, resolution uh, with uh, the, int uh, the, I'm trying to find the words here, uh, to allow those employees, the higher risk employees, the, the additional time to remain working at home until July the 6th. I mean, if that's the intent, I, I mean, I, I would support that because there are some, there are some employees that might be at higher risk and would be better for them to stay at home while they get receive their pay. And we're just basically giving them another month to stay at home. Is that not, I thought that's what I understood. Um, yes, Mrs. Christie, I apologize if my feed cut out, but it was my intent and my motion as stated was to approve um, the end of emergency to end the emergency school closure for staff and personnel as presented by the administration but like you just said extend those protections or that option those options for 
um, at-risk employees until July 6th. So it was my intent to approve it, but give at-risk With no added pay, just for them to continue giving them that extra month. Is that correct? I guess I'm willing to modify that based on this conversation. I don't know what that looks like. Honestly, I would, you know, welcome input from my colleagues on the board. Um, but just to keep it simple, it was to extend those protections for employees in at-risk populations until July 6th. And I know Mr. McLaughlin had mentioned, you know, the financial aspects of that, and I made the mistake of referencing that. Um, but again, I guess my intent of the motion is to extend that stay-at-home order for at-risk employees. Okay, Ms. Cantu. I, I, I was clear and then I get unclear because there's so much going on in, in this motion. Basically, I feel like we need to allow the superintendent to do what he needs to do and to take into consideration those those disabled or challenged um, employees that were due to return in June. Is that what I'm getting then? So the intent of my motion is to approve or, excuse me, my intent and my motion is to end the emergency school closure for staff and personnel. Okay. Allowing the superintendent and the administration to do that at whatever date they deem fit. However, I amended the end of school closure to exempt or provide protections that were already in place and approved by this board for at-risk employees until July 6th. Okay, so it's just that one month extension like Ms. Costilla was saying. Yes, and if things change or what have you, then the board can come back and modify that. Oh, okay, thank you. Hey, uh, I, I saw Ms. Halsey's hand and then heard Ms. Hansen, so we'll go Halsey Hansen. Go ahead, Ms. Halsey. I'm happy to defer to Ms. Hansen. That's all right, you're already there. Go ahead. Um, thanks. I just wanted to say that I really appreciate Mr. Wozniak and Ms. Baez that we'll be conducting additional trainings with employees as they're brought back in terms of procedures, protocols, and their rights, and what they can expect and what they can ask for. I think that goes a long way um, to create the, the expectations that we need in terms of maintaining everybody's health and safety. Um, so I appreciate that. I'm willing to support Mr. Arredondo's motion um, if we add that month for uh, employees who are at risk. And I would also then like to um, get a report back from this is the superintendent from you um, in the middle of June, letting us know how the first couple of weeks of uh, the reopening um, has proceeded in terms of whether or not people are sick, um, how many people are at a campus, how many people aren't, um, how we are enforcing the guidelines, et cetera. Okay, uh, Ms. Hansen. My understanding is that with this order, um, from what Mr. Wozniak and Mr. Cardona have said that this will be taken care of because they will have to complete a checklist about coming back in. And so those people will that qualify that we're talking about extending to July would, you know, would be part of this order anyway. Well, it's, yeah, it's unclear to me because I don't, uh, Mr. Wozniak's reading for something I haven't had a chance to review. The, the things he went over on the checklist had to do with health upon arrival. Maybe maybe there's also an additional checklist. Mr. Wozniak, is there an additional checklist that they have to complete with regard to their health history? Not their current health, but whatever puts them in a high risk pool. I think you're muted. Yeah, I, I think you, you were muted, but I, I don't know if that picked up on another mic, but that checklist had to do with COVID. Is that better? Symptoms. The checklist yes, I was ahead. referring to is, is specific COVID related symptoms that um, most businesses are using. Um, that's kind of what the county has adopted also to where it's a responsibility of the uh, supervisor working with the employee when they arrive to either, 
you know, you, you can do a temperature check. We do that on Fridays. We actually do the temperature check to our employees, or you can go the other way where they, um, they make a statement that they've done it themselves. Um, you can go either way with, with the temperature check, but, uh, yeah, the other, the, the list is just basically COVID symptoms. Okay. Wait, Mr. There Adonis. are some other questions on there. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. So Mr. Adonis. 65 or okay. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, Ms. Hanson? I was talking, so I, I apologize. So the checklist doesn't list like age 65 or over or uh, like somebody has COPD or something like that. The particular checklist that, um, that, CDC put out for businesses and employees to return. It says um, fever, it says chills, um, diarrhea, vomiting, um, BMI. The state government yeah. has 65 and over in, in different conditions on their checklist. Okay. This one in particular is one that obviously if you check yes, you get sent home. So this particular one that, that we were looking at doesn't say over 65. And then if you check yes, then we send you home. It says, you know, do you have a fever? So you need to go home. Hey, Mr. Arredondo. Um, I understand that this obviously has complicated the issue. I apologize for that. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to take into consideration is a majority of this school board falls into an at-risk population themselves and we continue to meet um, online and via Zoom out of respect and courtesy and quite frankly for my colleagues is safety um, and if we aren't willing to meet in person and follow these guidelines and assure each other safety then I think that our employees who match similar demographics and situations um, should at least have that extension until um, July as we get more data in regards to um, county health information. And so, again, I apologize for the confusion, but that's where I am this evening. Yeah, I understand, I think, the heart behind the motion. I just think it might have negative unintended consequences. We need people being aware of their risks and making decisions with regard to what they can do in this new environment, because this is going to be around. So the virus isn't going away on July 5th or whatever. And, you know, people that have to work in person, like the, I think Mr. Wozniak used an example of a, a mechanic who can't work remotely. We need that person to make, you know, the best decision for their own health um, and advise us of that so we can staff around gaps as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be in the business of telling people, oh, you're over 65, you must stay home. But I, I think that it's, you know, that's the wisest choice for people. And they're, they're independent, bright individuals that have worked their whole life and they know that. So that's more my, where I get hung up. I, I think the heart of the motion is fine. But Miss Castillo? Um, I think uh, it's, it's, I just need reassurance and I, I don't think that the administration uh, will not follow through with that. There are some employees that have underlying medical issues that are at risk. I just want to be assured that if this employee says, um, this is what I've got, especially a lot of people are diabetic and that's one of the uh, individuals that, that fall in the category of being most um, um, at a higher risk. I just want a reassurance that if the person says I'm diabetic, I, I just, I, I don't want, want to expose myself. I, I want to know that I feel want to be re reassured that they're going to be allowed to if possibly work from home um, um, until such time, like whether it's July the 6th or mid June or, or whatever. Um, that's where I'm coming from because the checklist that, that they're talking about talks about fever or whatever, but it doesn't ask the question as far as what the medical status is of that particular employee. And I think that's where my concern is. Um, uh, my husband has medical issues and I am very cautious when I'm at my office because I'm very concerned of what I might bring home. And um, 
there's some employees in my office that um, also prefer to work from home because of their medical underlying medical issues. So I just want to make sure that we that those do, that those employees, uh, you know, will will be also given the opportunity to either work remotely from from home, but specifically in, during this period of time where we don't even know what direction we're going and hopefully maybe who knows maybe we're going in a good direction that will come out more positive in the end but uh, I, I feel certain that uh, the administration will um, reassess individuals or uh, um, really listen to the request when if it is made from those individuals that have underlying medical issues. Hey, I think Mr. Arredondo has something else. Go ahead. You're muted. Uh, here, I unmuted. Go ahead. We've been told by the administration that they will, on a case-by-case -case basis, do what's best for employees, which I fundamentally, wholeheartedly, a thousand percent agree that they're going to do. So, based on the motion that I made, what are we preventing them from doing? If we're extending the protections that they have said are going to be afforded based on a case by case basis, employees are still going to work from home if possible, so on and so forth, they're going to do it, then what does this do? So, in Mrs. Castilla's example, wholeheartedly, if it member comes and says, I'm at risk, I have some type of condition, makes me at risk, and the administration has just said they're not going to ask them to come to work and that they're going to do what's best for them, please. I just don't understand where my motion is incongruent with what they say they're going to do, and we're just formalizing it to the board vote. I understand that there's a financial implication to my motion, but other than the financial implication, possibly, what is this doing to prevent the ISD from doing its work? We're asking people to come back if they're healthy. They're going to follow the X checklist. If they're not, the ISD said they're not going to ask them to come in for X, Y, and Z. What incongruent policy are we enacting in my motion that would complicate matters besides the financial aspect? Who are you asking? Anyone who wants to answer it, those blocking against the motion, or, okay. or staff members. I'm just so, I'm trying to understand where the hesitation is. I think I'm the only one that's jumped out and said I don't like it, the condition. I, so I'll speak uh, on that. I, I think the financial incentive is a, is a problem because it encourages people to make the wrong decision. We need to nudge people to make the best decision for their health. Uh, while at the same time not mandating what that decision would be. From my perspective as an individual trustee, I, and I trust the administration can balance that. I have eight, eight people that work for me, and I've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to think about how I can get them working but healthy and that no one would ever get sick at the office. That would be a nightmare for me. Um, and I'm, I know that Mr. Cardona you know, does that with the staff 100 times bigger. So... Um, I just think there's a lot of nuance around how you do this and the more flexibility, the better, as long as we trust the people exercising the, the flexibility. So that's why I didn't like the condition, but that's just me. I mean, if there's four of y'all, five, six of y'all that do, we can, I mean, it's definitely, we definitely talked it out. I totally support you, Mr. McLaughlin. Um, does anybody else have a question or concern? Oh, we can vote on this. Mr. Adondo, um, is yeah. your hand up? Or? As we end this, um, work from home order and um, the issuance of this policy. I hope my colleagues consider us looking at a way to follow the exact guidelines that are being put in place by the ISD for us to continue meeting for those who choose to do so. Um, if we're asking staff and employees to do that, I think we should lead by example and also meet in person as well. That's what we're doing that tonight, right? We you could be here. We have two trustees present, and Ms. Viapondo's 15 feet from me, although we're very close on the screen, as I see, but in person, we're very far. And there's a smattering of four people across the room, all, you know, and then those who wanted to attend by Zoom, we accommodated. So I, I want to continue that through the summer. It's optional. At least. It's, yeah. It's optional for 
us. It's optional for the staff who were there. And so right. this is optional. We're asking them to come back. So I agree that right now there's people at the high school, optional, who chose to be there. Same thing with the staff who are distance in the gallery, optional. So as we mandate our employees to come back and it's no longer optional, then I think you know, we should do the same. That's just right, but they would make the decision. It's still optional. They can, you know, they're they're in charge of of themselves and what's safest for them, and they can take extended family medical leave or the new health one, where they would continue to be paid without disruption if they're in a high risk group. And everybody's going to have to make that decision for themselves because they know their health, they know what they're comfortable with. Um, we can't make that decision for 800 people. So just to follow up, Mr. McLaughlin, it's your understanding that it's option if we remove the order that it's optional for all employees or at risk employees. I understand that those who have a health I think Mr. Wozniak was speaking speaking about this just a little bit, but in the new law or in the CARES Act, there's a different leave available for folks who cannot return to duty on account of specific health conditions for large employers like us and and they would I, I don't that's I do not believe it can be a cause for termination but I mean I'm maybe we, I'm not an employment lawyer um, I took one class one time but so I'm not given a legal opinion but that was my understanding of how it processed in large employee settings um, so that people could make their own decision about their health we're not going to want I mean I know I, I certainly hope we would never you know mandate you know, at the point of termination, someone make a decision that could be just terrible for their health and potentially lead to death. I mean, that would be, they, they make that own decision about what, what works for them. That's my understanding. So is the only hesitation the, I guess, based on my motions language is the time and a half for these employees? That's my biggest concern because it's a it sets up the wrong motivation. I might really need to pay a bill because my spouse lost a job or something, and I can go make time and a half by risking my compromised health. And maybe I've got to do that. And I, I wouldn't want anyone to be put in that bind. Well, uh, I'm willing to amend my motion then to say that, and if Miss Halsey agrees, because I believe it's a second, was that the board and the emergency proposal for staff and personnel, but for those deemed at risk, the protections of the end of school closure for staff and personnel due to an emergency, those protections and those benefits be extended to them until July 6th, excluding time and a half. I think Ms. Cantu was your second, is that, it was, or were you Ms. Halsey? I have a I have a question. I okay, I'll get to that in a second. Was it I you? It was do, do you support that friendly support amendment? That, to the, yes. Okay, so it, so we'll vote it as modified. Ms. Cantu, your question? My question is, those people that are going to be required to come back in June who have children that they require daycare for and their daycares are not open, what is going to be available for them? Governor Abbott just opened the daycares today. So if, first, let me just say, you know, I know it's difficult legislating policy, but you can't legislate right now every what if. Like we don't even know what's happening. And you're, you're sitting here debating this for, you know, almost 45 minutes. We, we are getting guidance daily that changes. And, you know, we're gonna treat our employees with the utmost of safety. So if somebody does come come up and say they can't, then we're gonna try and accommodate them as best we can. But if it's a mechanic who has to fix a bus and we send that person home, that's not, that's not necessarily, necessarily something, something that we can, we can say, say, hey, go at home and work from home. So I know that as board members, you wanna try and solve every, you can't solve every situation right now because we don't know them. And so just from the time I made the decision about graduation to now, Abbott then goes and contradicts me and says, oh, you know, you can graduate starting June 1st, even though we all know that it's not safe. Mm -hmm. And so I say that to say, you know, we, we're going to see guidance from TEA as this evolves because all of this is new. Some of the stuff y'all are talking about, we don't know what we're dealing with because they, they're still figuring it out 
themselves. So, you know, we may be a test case where somebody comes in and says, hey, um, I have a criteria or I'm recovering. You know, we have employees at central office that we know are recovering from cancer and we've already told them work from home. We were not going to, we're not going to hold you accountable. Work from home. You know, we want you to be safe. I personally sent her to home. She's not allowed up at central office. And we, I don't think she would say that any of her life functions have been disrupted. And so the motion is simply just, you know, Mr. Wozniak, Wozniak has already expressed that the majority of transportation and child nutrition, they're going to make more money by rescinding the emergency order, so to speak. And, you know, we're going to treat our employees right. We're going to do it right by our, our employees. And we don't know the what ifs. We don't know. I can't answer the what ifs or you shouldn't be trying to legislate the what ifs. You should just trust us to do the job that you know that we're going to do. And that's take care of our people that we need to take care of. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we've got a motion in a second that has been well discussed it is now changed slightly and we're ready to vote. So any, all in favor. All right. Four and uh, opposed. Aye. Okay. Miss Costilla, I'm sorry. The way your camera is set, I, I couldn't tell if you were oppo opposed. Okay. So that'll carry. Reopen. No, I was in favor. Mr. McCarthy, oh, I was in okay. Yes. Okay. The way you were sitting, it was hard to tell. All right, five two to uh, reopen on under I, and on item nine J and K. These are both my items that I did not. I was not at agenda prep. It's my fault. So I'm, and neither of these is an emergency. So on account of it being late, I'm going to table my items nine J and nine K unless someone else is opposed to me doing that. Uh, to the next board meeting and that way we can discuss what it is I'm talking about at agenda prep and people can be more prepared which takes Ms. us to okay I'm sorry Mr. Ms. McCoughlin uh, on the item that we just voted on what was it count five to two it carried was five it to? to two uh Hansen and Via Pondo opposed oh okay all right thank you all right sure that takes us to closed session um item 10 where we're gonna cover A and B, but C has been pulled. So I don't know, are we going to a separate room, Michael? Or? No, we're going to, if you could just give us just a little bit, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Hubenak is shutting down YouTube Live and then we're moving everybody but board and myself too. And then if you guys can just leave the room, everybody in here. Can we take a five minute break? Yes, yeah, it'll, it'll take us a little bit. 846.
can't vote. Motion second vote. Okay. okay, we are back, we are back. after our executive, our executive session. session. I think there's a number of items we are going to hit. Um, I'll entertain a motion. Ms. Halsey? Uh, Mr. McLaughlin, I, on the matter of considering approval of contracts of non-administrative professional personnel for the 2020-2021 school year, I move that the board approve the recommendations of the above personnel list as presented by administration. I'll second. Motion by Halsey, second by Arredondo to approve the list provided in our board book on item 10A. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I think I heard seven ayes. We'll go with that. Seven zero. Ms. Halsey. Mr. President, I move that the board approve for the hire of assistant superintendent business and support, Mr. James Barton. I second. Motion Halsey, second Hansen. Hold on, let me write that down real quick. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? I thought I heard seven people, that carries seven zero. Next up, Ms. Alzi. Mr. President, I move that the board accept the recommendation of Superintendent Cardona to hire as the next Crockett AP, Annalisa Holmes. Second. Okay, motion by Halsey. Second by Arredondo for Ms. Holmes as Crockett AP. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. Chair. Any opposed? None. Seven zero that carries. Ms. Halsey. Mr. President, I move that the board accept the recommendation of Superintendent Cardona to hire as the San Marcos High School AP number one, Cameron McPherson. Second. Motion by Halsey, second by Arredondo uh, to hire as the high school AP, Cameron McPherson. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. None opposed. I'm going to abstain because I have nothing against Mr. McPherson and consider him qualified, but I am not convinced this is a position we need to fill at this time. Ms. Halsey. Mr. President, I move that the board accept the recommendation of Superintendent Cardona and hires the San Marcos High School AP number two, Lacey Matajowski. Second. Matajowski with a motion by Halsey, second by Arredondo. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. None. I again will abstain for the same reasons as to the position's necessity at a time like this. Ms. Halsey. Mr. President, I move that the board accept the recommendation of Superintendent Cardona and hire as the Mendez Elementary School Principal, Christina Woody. I can't. Motion by Halsey, second by Arredondo to hire Christina Woodley as the Mendez Principal. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries seven zero. That leaves one. Ms. Halsey. Mr. President, I move that the board accept the recommendation of Superintendent Cardona and hire as the next athletic director, head football coach for San Marcos, Mr. John Walsh. Second. Motion by Halsey, second by Arredondo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ah, that carries 7-0. Congratulations to everyone. Yeah, all of you, uh, congratulations. One, one second, real quick. I'm gonna introduce you to Miss Christina Woody so she can say something. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to just get to introduce myself as a very proud principal of Mendez Elementary. I've been able to spend time here in SMCIC last year, working with our parent liaisons, 
and they've really taught me the value of listening and just valuing and investing in our community. And prior to that, I've served as a camp administrator, I've been an instructional coach, um, and an elementary here at heart. Too. So I'm so excited to continue making it as the best place it can possibly be for the kids. They're exceptional and they deserve it. So thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And then with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce you to Coach John Walsh. Hello, thank you. Mr. Cardona, I'll start off by just thanking you for extending the offer and thank the Board of Trustees for, for voting me in. I'm, I'm really excited. My, my family's excited about getting to San Marcos and uh, the more we dove into the school district and looked at, at uh, what SMC ISD had to offer, we can't, we, we, we couldn't be more delighted and I can't wait to get my feet on the ground and start meeting people. Congratulations. We're thank excited you. to have you. Welcome, Coach. Welcome, Christina. We're excited to have you guys. and All, all of y'all. Yeah. All the other admissions. Congratulations. Who's, where, who's that Martin guy? Where's he? Yeah, no, I caught him by surprise. He's, <laughs> he's up there. All right. That's, we, we know him. I was just kind of joking. Uh, anybody want a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Again. Adjourn. All right. Motion by Cantu. Second by Redondo. All in favor? Uh, all right. We'll be adjourned at 7-0. Thank you all.